and welcome to Morgan Meets the Eye. My name is Evan Morgan, and I'm the host of this series. So first things first, I want to thank you all for tuning in, and I do want to encourage you to follow me on social media. So my Twitter handle is at NotSpicedRum, and my Instagram handle is at some guy named Morgan. So make sure to subscribe to my YouTube page, and certainly keep up with the show on Apple, Spotify, or upon whichever streaming platforms it is available. So today I'm speaking with Scott, who's probably best known through his involvement with Fabian Liberty. And Fabian Liberty is known for its streams and content, which are primarily through sites such as Twitch and Rumble, though they do have a presence elsewhere as well. So I figured I'd just leave it up open to Scott right now to go ahead and you know tell us where we can find them and you know what his views are. Yeah, so um, I'm Scott from Fabian Liberty. Um, you know, we started out on Twitch, you know, kind of uploading things on um, YouTube and stuff, but the censorship um, on on Twitch got to such a point where we felt it was necessary to go ahead and start moving our content over to rumble. So if you want to catch us live, definitely check us out on rumble. Um, just search for Fabian Liberty and you'll find us. Um, Liberty underscore Fabian at, uh, on Twitter. Um, but again, if you just search for Fabian Liberty, like I'll be the one you find. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a libertarian or an anarcho capitalist, um, whichever label you prefer. Some days I might even wear my voluntarist hat though. Not really. I just, I just call myself a libertarian more often than not. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, I mean, I've done a bunch of debates and a bunch of fun stuff, but, um, you know, Morgan, you, uh, you kind of DM'd me and I saw you had done some other nerdy content and, and, and I say nerdy because, you know, a lot of libertarians do this kind of podcasty, you know, talk populist kind of very low, low, um, level of theory analysis of everything, which is popular. And I enjoy that. And I do a lot of that myself. Um, but I, I do, I do enjoy being able to talk with someone about, you know, some of the more nerdier kind of, um, of, of things from time to time. Just as, you know, as a jumping off point, how would you describe the overall message that you're trying to send to society as concisely as possible? Oh, I, I mean, it's what message am I attempting to send to society uh, as concisely as possible? Um, I don't know that I'm speaking to society is the right answer there. Actually, like, don't get me wrong. Like I want society to adopt the non-aggression principle. I want society to give up on so much of its statist views. Um, you know, I want to convince people, but I, I don't know that I'm actually speaking to society so much as I'm speaking to people that are like-minded on this Liberty movement. And I'm looking for those kind of those diamonds in the rough people that will get it that will get it fully and get it because, you know, much like kind of, I don't know that I fully subscribe to like objectivist kind of idea here, but like this great man theory, you know, I, I don't think there are a lot of people that are capable of becoming philosophers of the ideals. And so I'm looking for those people while trying to be entertaining and grab those members of the Liberty movement around me. And like, yeah, hopefully I can shift the needle a little bit talking to people about, you know, waking them up to some of the abuses of the state and things like that. But I, I don't know that I'm really particularly talking to society at large. I think that's a very good answer right there. And, you know, my take on this, you know, I would personally argue that, you know, the real problem, even more than the idea of centralized government itself, itself you know, at its the most fundamental core, would come down to theft. And what I mean by theft here in this context is that, you know, because this is a term that a lot of many statist and more leftist ideologies would kind of twist around is really, in this sense, I would mean theft as violation of inherent property rights. And this violation is committed, you know, through the use of force in this case, which I consider to be a second problem uh, that can be used. Now, can force, can theft and force happen outside of the government? You know, absolutely. You know, I would say that, you know, some random mugger on the street could steal your wallet and, you know, and that act and, you know, perhaps by that extension, you know, that person himself is being anti-libertarian. But, you know, the reason I spend so much time railing against the state personally is because it's structured and pretty elaborately in a lot of cases, you know, purposefully to hinder the justice process. So if the IRS steals from you, you know, what are you going to do? I mean, it's like there's virtually nothing you can do, you know, legally, that is. But but that's really the thing. You know, the state enables theft through its own laws. Whereas you can ideally, you know, and I want to emphasize ideally here because we don't actually live in an anarcho-capitalist society, unfortunately, 
Uh, you can ideally take action against someone who's robbed you. You know, you can receive comp recompensation for what you've lost. And, you know, the punishment, you know, for that person, you know, who actually violated your property rights in the first place uh, would, you know, that they received would deter other, you know, would-be thieves from violating the property rights of other people on a widespread social scale. Uh, but this process can't be, cannot be used against the state, you know, because the state has bestowed upon itself this forceful monopoly. And what a forceful monopoly really boils down to is that the state has essentially given itself through the illusion of democracy, really, uh, a kind of basically a golden ticket that gives it a special status above everything that's not the state. So basically this ticket or, you know, whatever metaphor you want to use in this case would allow the government to use force where nobody else is allowed to. And the consequences of this are that if the government, you know, mugs you, you don't really have any recourse there and they get to go free and keep on committing thefts and, you know, making huge oversights and so on and so forth. And also if the government, you know, quote unquote, democratically elects, you know, to take some action such as, you know, let's say building a highway where there's not demand for one organically, uh, whereas that would mean a huge problem if for a company that's in the private sector. It could, it could perhaps go out of business altogether. You know, the government isn't going to go out of business. That's obviously not going to happen. They can just print up more money out of thin air, which, of course, nobody else is allowed to do. And they can use that money to essentially keep themselves in business. And while we're talking about money, the money supply, you know, what if people tried using a medium of exchange other than the U.S. dollar or the euro or whatever state mandated currency is in place? I mean, because then, you know, this the state's going to use force against you if you do that. And that could be in the form of maybe a fine, maybe community service, because, you know, it's more free labor for the state, or in the most likely outcome, which would probably be prison. So basically what I'm saying here in short is that it's hard to establish any system against theft by the state. You know, when the state itself is the system you're trying to get reimbursed through. But I know, you know, a lot of idiots out there are going to call this perspective, you know, melodramatic or naive or idealistic or, you know, whatever, you know, it's like the list of ad hominems goes on and on. But as for you, so what argument would you make to convince someone that it it's in fact statism that is actually utopian and not anarcho-capitalism? So the, the, the first thing I would do is, so what you ran through was a, was a very consequentialist argument, right? Like what you ran through is, these are the consequences of the state saying that this isn't theft. Here's how it looks. And then we can compare those things. And, and it's not a bad argument, right? I mean, there is always this kind of idea of like attack the left from the left and attack the right from the right. Um, but when, when, when attempting to really boil it down to, to the real problem, the real problem is that the state has coerced people into uh, and propagandized people into this justification process. Right. That the state is justified in its theft. Right. I, you know, I, I prefer aggression because it's all encompassing. Right. But if we want to look specifically at the theft, right, then, you know, it's, it's hard to separate it from the violence that backs up that theft. But nevertheless, even if we look at the theft, we, we can do a, you know, a consequentialist argument. Right. And we can talk about how, you know, the IRS is the worst from a consequentialist standpoint, because if we were to take, for example, a mafia, you know, a mafia is in competition with other mafias. And so a mafia and a mafia has to turn a profit, right? So a mafia can only be so abusive to its people. Otherwise, you know, they're more receptive to another, you know, ethnic group or another, um, you know, another mafia of some sort in the area that they may prefer to get their protection money from. Um, and, and yes, they lose resources fighting, right? Um, and, and that, that certainly is true, but like a mafia, the mafia won't, you know, they'll break your legs. They're not going to kill you unless it's incredibly egregious. Right. Whereas, you know, the, the state will throw you in prison with, with, with no ability to gain money um, for whatever its public works are because it needs that. And so, so I mean, there's plenty of ways you can make, um, I'm sorry, because it doesn't need it because it has this, you know, monopoly on power and violence. Um, the thing that I would say is that the state, I wouldn't say that the state is utopian. Right. Like I, I actually wouldn't make that claim. Right. Like the state can function and does function. Right. I, I tend to look at it, you know, if we're going to take a consequentialist framework, kind of like um, moral landscape theory. Right. Um, there's a wonderful TEDx and, and, you know, and I hate the guy because he's got a ton of terrible takes. Um, oh, fuck. Who came up with moral landscape theory? He's one of the four horsemen um, against Christian apologists. It was it's not Daniel Dinnan or Christopher Hitchens. It's the guy that said Sam terrible Harris. things. Sam Harris. Thank you. 
Sam Harris came up with it, right? And he said, like, you know, do we treat women perfectly in American society? Um, well, obviously not, right? Like, like we can look at a, a a magazine at a at a store and the way that we objectify women and realize that this isn't the best way of doing things. But that doesn't mean that we can't say that we're not better than Saudi Arabia, right? And so I would kind of say the same thing about the state is that like there are worse states from a consequentialist perspective, right? There are states that I would rather like not live under. And if I was, you know, gun to head forced to choose, right? Like you kind of end up going to the other, um, you know what I mean? Like you, if you had to live in America or you had to live in North Korea, it's not a difficult decision to say, I'd rather live in America. Right. Um, so it's not utopian, right? I think utopian is the wrong word. But what it is, you, what it is, 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 is understanding the, uh, the, the underlying process here. And the underlying process is that it's a meta evil. And, and I, and I call it a meta evil because justifying aggression and attempting to justify aggression is something that, that once you do that, there is no end point, right? There is no, there is no level of unacceptable things. And to give you an example that I think works really well with like conservatives, for example, is I talk with them and, you know, and I say, look at all these horrible things during COVID, right? And they're like, yes, the lockdowns were terrible. The trust, the science was terrible. All these things were terrible. And I'm like, yeah, that's why the government shouldn't have that power. And then they're like, hold up, hold up, hold up. What if there was a virus that kills 90% of people, yada, yada, yada. The government has to have the ability in that case. And it's like, yeah, but your justification for aggression and violence and theft and control over you is no different for the 90% virus versus COVID because you gave them that power. And then you told them that they needed to justify that power, not based off of whether or not it was right or wrong to do so, not whether or not people have rights that can or can't be violated, but instead that the consequential outcomes will be preferable. And once you do that, well, then you can cook the science. You can cook the numbers. You can propagandize political opinion. And, and so any of this power is, is, is an open festering wound that is just waiting to be infected by any virus or any, any bacteria that, that passes by with the wind, right? It's like, so it can work for a period of time, but that justification of that system is begging for Oh, I don't know, communism or fascism or any other form of totalitarian government that you want to insert here. That's the worst thing imaginable, right? It's like, you've already justified that form of governance. It's just that you think this checks and balances based off of this, you know, ends justify the means analysis will work. And it's like, well, just turn on your fucking TV. Is it working? No, like it's, it's like their logic is, is, is devoid. None of it makes any sense. Right. I see what you're saying. Yes. And, you know, going off from there, just as far as the topic of force goes, I've, I've also, there's also, you know, a conversation to be had reg regarding, you know, the use of force. So, I mean, you and I are both, you know, technically anarchists. In fact, you know, you know as a matter of fact, let me rephrase that. You know, we're anarchists. There's nothing technical about it. But obviously, there are plenty of people out there, you know, probably left-wing anarchists, who are going to argue that capitalism is just, you know, completely incompatible with anarchism because it involves hierarchies. And, you know, my, my moral compass has always been in accordance with, you know, the Gadsden flag, you know, the classic don't tread on me line. But what I mean by this is that I don't consider hierarchies themselves to be the problem, but rather forces. And for example, I don't care if somebody's at a higher place than me on the totem pole, because that in itself is none of my business. And just the fact that somebody has a higher social status than me is not an aggression. But anyway, you know, from here, a lot of the more left wing anarchists might pivot to the argument that capitalism's, you know, inherently exploitative. And my response to them, you know, to keep it as brief and as simple as possible, would simply go to read, you know, Bombavirk, you know, Karl Marx and the close of his system, you know, does an excellent job addressing this whole half thought out notion that labor is exploited by the employer. Mm -hmm. But anyway, you know, I don't believe that capitalism sets up a master slave dynamic, but more of, you know, a buyer seller relationship. It's not until I wouldn't say I would say that it's not so much until the state gets involved and starts subsidizing these businesses, you know, in the case of bad decisions and investments. I mean, we've seen that as well with a lot of the recessions that were actually caused by that directly. But basically, 
through these businesses, through being given state protection, which obviously in itself is completely incompatible with anarcho-capitalism, which is the only true form of capitalism anyway, I would well, I would venture to say, uh, that the dynamic drifts to the more exploitative, you know, lord and bondsman relationship that we see in a lot of Hegel and Marx and things like that. So yes, you know, long story short, I say that we should be opposed to force and not opposed to hierarchies inherently. And unquestionably, I would say that the state uses more force than anyone else. And plus, you know, hierarchies will always exist in some form. So it only follows that any attempt made to extinguish them is just, you know, it's you know, to extinguish them completely, that's going to require force. And which is ironically the very thing that these left-wing anarchists are allegedly, you know, opposed to. Mm -hmm. Although, any, you know, anyway, though, you know, I'm kind of curious about what your take on this is. So how would you convince somebody that calling for a system that, you know, involves hierarchies, you know, should by no means be conflated with calling for the status quo? Or maybe to say that, you know, that hierarchies are necessary, but a state monopoly on force is not. So what I would say first and foremost is, you, you know, you kind of already hit it, which is that hierarchies are just a, a natural occurrence. Equality is a myth. Equality doesn't exist. It doesn't exist anywhere on the planet. It doesn't exist in any ecosystem. It doesn't exist between humans, right? Um, voluntary hierarchies is the first thing you need to establish is you need to get them to bite the bullet that voluntary hierarchy exists, right? So if, you know, Liquid Zulu, who you spoke to, has a wonderful example of this. And I think it, it's it's funny because it also it also makes them doubly bite the bullet, which is, you know, elitism and, and things like that in the culture that they don't like, which is the voluntary relationship between a tennis instructor and someone who can't play tennis, right? Like this is a person that goes to someone else who is an expert in a certain thing and is willing to submit to what it is that they tell them to do, right? I voluntarily choose for you to tell me that my form is off, for you to come over and say, nope, you need to move your foot this degree. Nope, you need to do this, right? I, I, I literally choose to have the master and I be the slave in this, you know, analogy, though master and slave is obviously not the right terms, but, but voluntary hierarchies exist. The, the real thing to understand about the leftists and their reframing of anarchism, you know, just going back a little bit, Right. I do want to point out that, you know, you can the, the problem is, is that they have a belief. Right. So if you read, um, you know, I, I recently went through the first two chapters out of four. I plan on finishing it tomorrow. But I was listening you know, to the audiobook and taking notes of um, Ingalls, um, Socialism, Utopian and Scientific. Right. And then he has a quote. And the quote is in his introduction, he says, um, you know, power and freedom are are. Um, what does he say? It's power and freedom are, he basically says power and freedom are the same. Uh, I want to get the exact quote. So give me just a second and I can pull it up if I can remember it exactly. Power and freedom are identical. That's what it is. Power and freedom are identical. This is the notion that is bled into left-wing anarchism, right? And is really kind of like reinforced through Kapok and, and beyond, right? So what we have to understand is when you ask them, where does anarchism begin? They'll never give you an answer. Right. Every proto anarchist society is anarchist. Right. There is no beginning to anarchism. And yet there is a beginning to the philosophy of anarchism and, and it being written down and it being kind of like debated as a philosophy. And that's Proudhon. Right. And you'll see a bunch of left wingers that have never led, never actually read property is theft, but they'll quote property is theft from some other person that told them what's in property is theft by Proudhon. Right. And it's like it's the same book where he says property is liberty. Right. If you read Proudhon, even if even Bakunin, but especially Proudhon and especially Josiah Warren, Lysander Spooner, Benjamin Tucker, the, the early anarchists very much agreed and understood that natural hierarchies must exist. So where's the poison? The poison against this idea is positive rights. That's really where it's all coming from, is this belief that nature is coercive, Right. And that because nature is coercive, the coercion of man is pales in comparison to the coercion of nature, right? And what I mean by that is that the default state of man is poverty. The default state of man is to own nothing that you don't work for. Even Lenin admits that if you, if you, if you want to eat, you must work, right? That everyone knows that you must work. And so they sell this idea of utopianism. They sell this idea that once the state is dissolved, We'll all communally work together. And it's like, 
sure, plenty of people may choose voluntarily to communally work together towards all kinds of things, mutual aid and praxis. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. Right. But the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, if nobody works, nobody eats. And, and, and so at a certain point, some people are going to be forced to do things that they don't want to do. And they're going to need some form of incentive and they're going to create this giant structure you know, of like rewards and charity and all these things that are going to magically make the, the natural impulses of man and the natural order of the universe go away. Well, they're, they're fucking not. And even if they do, the question then becomes, well, the real question, the way that you really expose this is that you ask them, okay, well, me and my buddies want to do a capitalism. We don't care about you, right? We're going to leave and go do a capitalism. What are you going to do? And if their answer is nothing, then congratulations, you're an anarcho-capitalist. You just want to live on a communist commune. Congratulations. Like, you respect your borders, I respect mine, et cetera, et cetera. If your answer is, you don't get to leave, or we're going to stop you, or you can go set up your area, but I don't respect your borders or your property at all, and I'm going to take whatever you make because it's mine too, right? Well, then congratulations, you just created a war you just created an enforcement mechanism. You just created a state that's going to impose on people for their voluntary transactions. But the real key, the real key to understanding where the leftism has this brain rot in, in anarcho-communism, anarcho-socialism, anarcho-syndicalism, and even to a degree, the mutualists, though I, I do like them from time to time. They are fairly based. Not bad. Is, is, the, is really that, right? Is that they believe that there is positive and negative rights. Right. That you have a right to food, that you have a right to health care, that you have a right to education. Right. That these things ought not. Right. Which implies a moral imposition. Right. Ought not be denied. And once you say that these things ought not be denied, then you come into direct conflict with people's negative rights. And this is why it's important, you know, going deeper in to explain you know, where negative rights come from, argumentation ethics, you know, where does conflict occur? How is private property established, et cetera. Um, but yeah, that, that's the real issue is that I would consider them non-archists. I wouldn't consider them anarchists. I would consider anyone that says that capitalism must be destroyed because of its exploitive nature, despite its voluntary transactions are, are not anarchists at all. Um, but unfortunately, you know, History has done a number to Benjamin Tucker and Josiah Warren and Lysander Spooner as these people disappeared, as hair most, you know, moved into the Americas and created a violent anarchist movement. You know, the anarcho-individualists fell off and it was up to Rothbard to resurrect that movement and even Benjamin Tucker's writings that were almost completely lost in a, in a New York City library. Um, and so, you know, we're... You know, we're 50 years into this and they've had since since the beginning to poison the name anarchism. And so it is a philosophical war that must be won um, in the name of liberty and anarchism and individual freedom and rights. Very good. And, you know, as we know, you know, the libertarian movement is pretty tightly connected with, you know, the Austrian School of Economics. And what I found is that this school is, you know, it's very crucial but it's not spoken about frequently. It's almost has kind of a cult following in the grand scheme of things compared to a lot of the, the mainstream economics. And I think what prevents a lot of people from accepting this school of thought is that it's, you know, from a certain perspective, it could be taken as not quite as complex as a lot of other schools of thought, such as, you know, Keynesianism and, you know, the new Keynes. So basically, I would say that, you know, if, you know, the Austrian school is to be seen as not quite as complex, it's because it's not constantly trying to work around the problems created by the state. Mm -hmm. And you know, so, for, you know, the most fundamental laws of economics are supply and demand. And, you know, whether it's through influencing the accessibility to money, or whether through price control, the state is always there, you know, essentially making it look as though there's supply where there isn't or where there's demand where there isn't. So basically, a lot of people seem to be laboring under this kind of illusion, really, uh, that, you know, there's more there, there's more available and that there's more demand for things. So businesses end up making poor decisions, you know, and this is basically in line with the Austrian, you know, business cycle theory, you know, the whole boom and the bust, where it's basically because of these these bad price signals, you know, companies will go and make these bad investments, uh, but they won't realize until it's too late. And then when the credit retracts 
And yet, next thing you know, there's some, there could be some type of recession or even a depression in some, you know, more extreme cases. But despite this, you know, if you look at, you know, an economics textbook for or something, you know, with, you might find, you know, a reference to Hayek or something, you know, um, but, you, but you're not going to hear about Mises and you're, you're not going to, you're certainly not going to hear about Rothbard and, you know, a mainstream economics textbook. Not until grad school. Right, exactly. So in that case, I guess, what, what would you, what would you say exactly is the cause of this? Why do you think that, you know, there's just not that much presence of the Austrian school, you know, why it isn't quite as mainstream as, you know, other schools of thought? I think it's because if you, if you, if you accept Austrian economics, you must by conclusion, you know, following those thoughts through to conclusion, accept that the, the state's interference in the market, central banking, fiat currency, all of these things that prop up the state's power. Um, if once you accept Austrian or Messian economic theory as like the, you know, the, the, the best way to view, uh, economics not you don't even have to accept it as like the golden truth but once you accept it as the primary way that things should look at should be should be viewed then your next conclusion is abolish the fed <laughs> abolish fiat currency um you know uh give up states power in alaska for example give up state fully privatize everything to the highest extent like you don't have to go full-blown anarchist right just because of Austrian economic theory, but you certainly would have to recognize that all of these, like, especially if you accept the economic calculation problem, right? Then every state, every state monopoly and every form of, 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 of government regulation that isn't due to like some massive, you know, negative externality, um, is something that is interfering with the market and stealing wealth from people stealing wealth from future generations via inflation. And so if you accept all of that, you know, then, then you're going to, in order to get papers published, in order to get grants, in order to gain popularity, you have to go against the cathedral, right? And the cathedral, I mean, you know, from a, from a Michael Malice, but originally, you know, courtesy Arvin, yeah. um, Minchus Molbug perspective, that you have to go against the media institution, the state, the three letter agencies and the largest corporations that have, have engaged in regulatory capture and have their cushy spots with their pseudo monopolies gained by the state. Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, I don't know the exact reason, but I can certainly say that the incentive structures are completely against economic, um, a, you know, an, a, 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 a wealth of knowledge of, of, um, of Austrian economic theory, right? Like, and on top of that, Let's be honest, economics is boring to most people, right? Econ is not an interesting, it can be interesting. And I know that this will piss off the libertarians that watch, right? Because most of you probably found libertarianism or anarcho-capitalism through Austrian economic theory. But to normal people, right, beyond kind of just talking a little bit about business decisions and like, you know, and like supply and demand, because it can be like kind of cool and like investment strategies, like, People can kind of get into that because there's an incentive of their money, but people don't care about like, let's look at this from the perspective of the evenly rotating economy, right? Like when those words come out of your mouth, people tune out. And, and so this allows for a certain elite group of people to have a kind of an, an elite knowledge, right? Like in the sense that there are a rare few autistic people that are really interested by economic theory. Right. And so because it's not a widely adopted theory, plus all of the other things that I explained, it's, you know, the people that are really doing economics, if you will, are the people that are occult knowledge thinking. Um, the people that are doing economics, if you will, are elites that are college educated, that have had plenty of time to be indoctrinated by that system and that rub, you know, like that, that, that gain their funding from academic institutions that are statist or from large corporations that are funding these things that are status, you know? So it's, it's a, it's, it's something that I think that only the investment bros will be able to break through. I don't think it's going to be libertarian podcasters. I think it's going to be like the Bitcoin bros and the NFT guys, and they can't stop being cringe. And if they can stop being cringe, right? Like the, you know, like one person in particular, like Clint Russell is a good example of this, you know, that can talk to these issues and kind of bridge that gap. But it's going to be the investment bros and the crypto bros 
and the people like that, that through proof of concept will make money because of these ideas, because they'll be able to view the landscape from a more realistic position. And, and I think that the proof is kind of in the pudding. So I think those are going to be the guys that might be able to turn the tide a little bit in terms of messaging on that. But, but for people that have to entertain people, economic theory is just not fucking entertaining. It just isn't. Right. And, you know, like, as you know, you know, economics and finance are very closely interrelated and, you know, finance can be pretty complicated. I would even say to an extent that finance is probably more complex than economics, you know, because of that, I think some people might jump off of that kind of reasoning and think that, okay, economics should be very complex. And, you know, let's look at these extremely complex schools of thought, you know, and, you know, let's say, so if you hear economics, you hear about praxeology, you hear about the type of reasoning there, you hear the saying, saying, don't treat economics as a hard science you know, recognize it as a social science, you know, don't treat it like physics or chemistry. You know, they might hear that and think, oh, that, that, they might think, oh, that's too subjective. So, you know, I can't really get behind that. At least these Keynesians then, you know, they might be seen as more honest, even though they obviously aren't. Uh, they might see that and think like, okay, well, they're more in tune with reality because they're willing to face, you know, the numbers and, you know, crunch these numbers and see the way that things actually are. So that's basically, you know, my my kind of take on why I could see why I could see some people kind of being drawn away from the Austrian school, but you know I know there's a Thomas Sowell quote and I'm I'm gonna I mean I'm gonna botch this so badly where it's basically that the truth itself is rarely complex but it's basically what what makes things complex is evading the truth and it's almost so because they're you know trying to make all these excuses for the state that's going to necessarily you know complicate things and make economics a little harder to decipher for the average person. But I think, you know, for the average person, you know, just understanding Austrian economics isn't that that complex, really, at least the basics. The, the problem I have with with it is that there is there are things that can be discovered through um, utility in terms of predictive power of many of these new schools of economics. And this is something most handcaps just will be like, you're full of shit. I hate you. You're lying. This is why you're right. dumb. Read more economics, right? They'll get mad at me. The hardcore Austrian school bros will tell me that I'm full of shit, but you, you can't, they also, many of the Austrian libertarians will just, they'll deny reality too. And one of the realities is, is that while MMT is full of shit and Keynesianism is mostly full of shit, some of these super complicated studies have some level of predictive power, right? And it's like, it's pattern recognition. They're not always accounting for every variable. And so they're attempting to predict the future. And like, it's like, if you can predict the future with 80% certainty, right? Then like, then you have to admit that there's some utility in that. You have to admit that there's some utility in being able to predict what, what changing, what let's say quantitative easing might do to certain markets. We studied quantitative easing, you know, in 10 different places, we studied things close to quantitative easing, and then we looked at what the overall impact of it was, and the Austrians will say, cool, you establish a historical fact. This doesn't actually tell us anything. Um, it's all junk. It's all pseudoscience. And it's like, yes, you're right. They established a historical fact. And they may have discovered nothing, but they also may have discovered something. And you're not willing to admit that they may have discovered something. And if it has a certain level of predictive, predictive power, then like we should, we should say, we should say, Hey, look, primarily we need to look at this as an Austrian and the, you know, quantitative easing is wrong morally for these reasons. Right. But that doesn't mean that we should just deny the predictive power of some of these economic models that are really complicated that, that, that mostly get it right. Now, when they can be proven wrong with, with Austrian economic theory, then we know they are wrong. When praxeology proves something to be wrong, then we know that it's wrong. And so for an example of this is Paul Krugman won a Nobel prize for proving that minimal and slow increases to minimum wage has zero effect on unemployment. All of the previous economic available data that we had before said this wasn't true. And Austrianism says, praxeology says this isn't true. Because if you, if you increase the price floor, right, by, by necessity, you must price out some individuals in the market. But because they decided to do new studies and decided to, you know, instead of looking at cities that were comparable in um, socioeconomic status, and demographics and things like that. They decided to use 
clo- cities that were closer because they might be culturally linked. It's like that's pseudoscience garbage. And I don't care what outcome you have if praxeology proves this to be wrong. But where praxeology says nothing, right? And we can't prove with with human action in economic theory as as rational self as 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 you know rational actors where we can't prove that we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater when we're making fun of MMTers and Keynesians and things like that. We should recognize that like, yeah, some of these models have some predictive power. It's a percentile. There's always a chance that it's wrong. And so they haven't actually proven anything. They've just said, Hey, look, when I roll these dice, you know what I mean? Sometimes you get snake eyes and you're just wrong, but it's cool to know that like, they're right if it rolls on everything else but snake eyes. And so that might be a good idea to implement, or that might be a good thing to think about. And so like, I don't know, I'm not a hardcore Austrian the way other people um, tend to be. I guess that makes me more Chicago school, but I'm also not Chicago school in the sense that I think Austrian economics is primary and correct. Right. That's actually pretty much how I would align myself as well. Um, So yeah, I definitely say that there's something of a gray area there, you know, as far as, you know, understanding, you know, yes, we have praxeology, but there are other, you know, basically even these other ideologies, you know, you might see these other ideas that come out, even though there might be a lot of it that's just garbage that we don't really need to listen to. Uh, there's definitely, I think there's room for some certain key concepts and other schools of thought as well that are still in line with, you know, the Austrian epistemology. But, you know, from here, I kind of wanted to pivot uh, to a concept, you know, within Austrian economics. I know you have, you have, you do have plenty of time spend a lot of time discussing this one, you know, the idea of argumentation ethics, you know, you know, Hoppe and, you know, different concepts such as that. So I'm just going to admit, you know, right off the bat that, you know, I, I admit, yeah, I'm not quite as well versed in argumentation ethics as I would like to be, but I do have a, gr- a grasp of the basics of it. You know, I mean, I get that it's, you know, a great concept, you know, it was put forth by Hans Hermann Hoppe. And, you know, he probably put that most notably, I would say, in the theory of socialism and capitalism, which basically proves that no argument can justify, you know, violating the principles that go with libertarian capitalism. Because, I mean, if we're just speaking in the most general terms here, these very same libertarian principles are already presupposed in every, you know, situation where somebody would question how valid they are. So, like I was saying, I'm kind of a doofus in this area, but I know about, you know, the the argument from argumentation, you know, being that, you know, you can't argue that you ought not argue, because you have to argue in order to do that. So, basically... What I, I think would be, you know, good to discuss here is how exactly can we use, you know, how exactly can argumentation ethics, you know, as a philosophy, just discussing these, you know, fundamental, you know, concepts here, how does that relate to us establishing that the best, you know, system we can set would be one with without any centralized government? First of all, a, first of all, AE is for nerds. <laughs> like, I, I know, I know it well, right? But it's, it's not. It's not a, um, it, it's, it's not, see the, see the biggest problem with libertarianism, and this isn't an AE thing, right? The biggest problem with libertarianism in terms of, I, I don't even say a problem, I would say challenge, right? With libertarianism is that it is not a complete philosophy. Libertarianism does not tell you what you ought to do, right? It is a descriptive legal framework um, that, People could say th- that proves via its contraries, but not its contradictions, um, what you ought not do at best, right? At best with AE, if you believe AE, you know, puts this forward um, and um, if you believe, if you believe so, then, then you are in a situation where you don't actually say this is how the world works or this is who you need to hate. This is who you need to fight, Right. Um, whereas Marxism does, right? Objectivism does, Christianity does, right? These are, these are full philosophies that have, you know, a metaphysics and have a moral vision for the future, right? And plenty of others, right? I was just naming a few of kind of the major players in, in, you know, in, pardon me, in the West, right? Obviously Islam does, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But so when you say, how can we use AE? You know, AE is really only a tool for those that are philosophically ready to grasp AE. And 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 A and 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 the thing is is that I wouldn't say that AE is super hard to grasp, but the conclusions that come from it 
are monumental. Once you accept argumentation ethics, then you must be an anarchist and you must be a capitalist. You can, you have no choice but to accept anarcho-capitalism once you, once you get it. Yeah. So, I mean, like I can explain AE, you know, we can talk about AE if you want. And, and, and I, and I, I feel like I can do it fairly well, but like as a tool, it, it is, it only works if people are willing to, willing to listen because it's, it's complicated. And so, you know what I mean? Like when having a debate or an argument with a, with a commie, right. They're just going to lie and weasel and you know what I mean? And, and come up with some reason to not believe in AE because it's kind of one of those things like Christopher Hitchens said, right? Like extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And the claim is, is that it is logically incoherent for anyone to say that you ought commit aggression to include you ought to tax or that you ought to have a state or that you um, ought not be allowed to engage in any voluntary transactions. And that's a huge claim. Very true. You know, so I mean, I guess talking about, you know, off, you know, argumentation ethics, we can also talk about basically, you know, the ideas that tend to go against argumentation ethics. You know, we talk about, you know, these contradictory ideas. We, you know, there's this whole utilitar utilitarianism idea where they might say, well, you know, maybe with, if we have a state, you know, maybe it'll at least serve this use. There's a lot of Machiavellianism in that I've noticed. And, you know, we can talk about that. You know, it's just, I don't think it's a very, it's the most rational way to go about things. Um, you know, the whole utilitarianism standpoint. But basically, I want to talk actually about nat natural law in this case, you know, about how, you know, that's influenced by John Locke and all of that. So basically, when we look at these different ph philosophical roots that have given way to, you know, the Austrians, you know, I mean, John Locke, you know, he came before Banger, you know, so it's like the Austrian school had not formally been established at that point. So what do you think would really be the the most fundamental root that has really, you know, created the Austrian school in this place or, or you know, liber the ter libertarian movement uh, to begin with? I mean, so like the problem is, is kind of like a, like, what do you, what do you value as the turning point? Right. Um, you know, personally, I would say Rothbard, right? Like, because that's when it's, that's when it's named, right? I mean, any, before Rothbard libertarianism is, um, is, you know, de Jacques libertarian socialism. It's, you know, it's a, it's an, I wouldn't say fully anti-capitalistic, but it's a, it's an anti-landed gentry, you know, pro-social democracy, uh, communal, you know, non-individualist um, kind of perspective here. Right. So, but like, if, if you want to say Austrian school, Menger's probably, probably good. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, if, if you want to bring up natural law, you could, you could say Locke popularized it. Um, but even still, like, you know, you could also talk about, you know, the, the anarchist roots, right? Like I mentioned earlier with Proudhon, you know, followed shortly after by, you know, we don't have much of his works, but apparently he was probably a pretty key figure. Shaw Day is understudy. Um, but, you know, Spooner and Warren and Tucker, you know what I mean? So I, I don't know how helpful it is to say where, where was the turning point? I, I, I don't, I don't know if I had to give an answer, at least in terms of libertarianism, I'd start with the guy that took the name back. You, you know what I mean? Um, both anarcho-capitalism and, and libertarianism technically start with Rothbard. But, but yeah, I mean, the, I, I think of uh, an understanding of the foundations is good. Um, the problem is, is that like Locke is wrong, right? Like, like he's not like he's wrong. So like, do I put him in the category of libertarian right. when he's, yeah. when he's wrong? You, you know what I mean? So, I mean, like, I don't, I'm not familiar enough with, with Menger's I'm, I'm like, economics is not my strong suit. So um, I'd have to go through again, but you know, Hayek and, and, and Menger and even Mises are statists, right? Like, you know, they, they're, you know, they're arguing for limited state intervention in the economy, but they're still statists. Um, but then again, do I say like Mises is not a libertarian, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's a murky water because libertarianism colloquially has become this, th there's no real strong definition for, it. um, and it's kind of, it's kind of the same that you see with a lot of philosophies, right? Like what is Christian or what is Marxism, right? Like, you know what I mean? Like to the Marxists, no Marxism was true Marxism. 
You, you know what I mean? Like the, the, it, it never existed. No, true Marxism has never been tried, you know? And, and I think that's probably true. And for the Christians, for example, you know, every other form of Christianity is wrong. Like we're the one true Christians. We got all the details, right? The, you know, the, the direction that the people make the cross on their chests in that other religion is totally wrong. And, you know, and they're, they're, they're not doing God any service. You know, it's, it's difficult to, it's difficult to say a starting point. Like Menger's a starting point for Austrianism, right? Rothbard's a starting point for libertarianism, but at the same time, all of these people are pulling from previous concepts. Right. Exactly. You know, I mean, as much as I, you know, adore Mises, you know, I mean, even he has some quotes that I would say are, you know, not good. I mean, he said, you know, he's openly said at some places that, you know, the government is absolutely necessary, you know, said that it, ha it, it's just required, which I mean, obviously as somebody who follows Rothbard, you know, I would not agree with, but I mean, then again, we wouldn't have Rothbard if it weren't for Mises, I would say. So it's just basically one thing follows after another. And we wouldn't have Hoppe if we didn't have Rothbard, right? And so like, and, and, and if we didn't have Hoppe and we didn't have Rothbard, then we wouldn't have Kinsella and we wouldn't have a good answer to how one deals with criminals. Um, until, you know, really grounding in the estoppel principle in criminal law. And, you know, and, and eventually there will be other problems, hopefully, that are, that, are, that are solved. Or I should say discovered. Solutions that are discovered. Because I think these things are objectively true. Right, yeah, that's true. I mean, I, I do like Kinsella, even though he is a bit of a goofball. Um, but in any case, you know, from here, I kind of want to get into the... How basically dare you, the sir? Uh, <laughs> but basically, I want to get into, you know, the, basically the fun part of the podcast from here, where basically there's this thing I, I often do with my guests where basically I'll try to argue from the perspective of somebody who's just, you know, very much against anarcho-capitalism, where they'll be trying to make arguments for why a state is necessary or why, you know capitalism by itself will just grow out of control and basically destroy society. Little devil's um, advocate. Right, exactly. So I've, you know, I mean, I've personally gotten into plenty of arguments with people over anarcho-capitalism, you know, whether it's at work or with neighbors or at the barber shop or whatever. But, you know, it's it's always been just a, it's never a, a pleasant experience. You know, I'm not the most skilled debater. I'm definitely not, you know, as skilled as you are with this sort of thing. So I'm, I figured I'd try, you know, taking a lot of their rebuttals and basically to spite them, you know, just to give them to you so that you can you know, provide a, a good rebuttal to them. So first off, um, I've noticed that a lot of the arguments against anarcho-capitalism come down to the idea that force is a necessity in society. You know, they might, you know, for as an example, let, let's say you had some detectives who might need to investigate a murder or something. And as a result, they have to go into businesses. They have to force their way in. You know, they might have to go into residences to try to research the culprit. You know, they would need to get search warrants. Or on another level, you know, you might take child protection services, for example. If, let's say, children are, you know, from a violent or an abusive household, you know, they might say, isn't force required in that case to seize the children away from, you know, abusive parents or things like that? So they might say, couldn't that in itself be required? Since force is necessary, they might say, and the state is known for force, don't er ergo, don't we require the state? Well, the answer is really simple, is that anarcho-capitalism isn't against force. It's against aggression. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's really that simple, is that this person that you're speaking of just has a misunderstanding of libertarianism. Um, and, and what I usually try, so there's a, there's a concept um, that... Um, this isn't to answer the devil's advocate. This is really more for educational kind of converse, conversational purposes. There's a concept um, of, um, oh my God. Um, he, oh my God, he used to work with fire. He's a psychologist. He's a social psychologist, but also moral. Jonathan Haidt, sorry. Jonathan Haidt came up with this concept, the writer and the elephant. It's not a new concept, though he's, you know, named it this way, Right. And that is, is that like, you know, good rhetoric, good conversation, you know, good argumentation, um, you know, as, you know, from the early sophists, they recognized that you needed kind of three, you needed Plato's tripartite, right? You needed logos, you needed ethos, you needed pathos, right? And so logos, the, the logos response here is, well, that's just wrong. Like you don't need a state to have force. Um, you can voluntarily agree um, to live in a community that, you know, gives certain representatives um, the, the, the power to engage in those forceful activities. And if you refuse to do that in any way, shape or form, then most people will not trade with you. They won't hang out with you. They won't accept your children into their public school. They won't like, or into their school, their private school, right? Like you're not going to be a member of a community unless you agree to like 
rights, en rights enforcement agency where you agree to some mechanism of force to be utilized in these scenarios, right? And so the state that you want is very similarly could be constructed um, on a voluntary basis. Um, what you don't get to do is you don't get to force on people this force, if you will, right? This is the aggression. Um, and so, you know, so when I say that, that, that Plato's tripartite, like that getting people over is that you can't just make that logical argument. Um, and ethos, I don't know how the fuck you would establish ethos there than just, you know, showing that, you know, what you're talking, um, but the pathos there, you know, can be done in the form of comedy or in the form of, you know, a common ground, if you will. Right. So if you're talking to a Democrat, be like, no, 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 you, you've heard from people that don't actually understand the philosophy, right? So let's say you're talking to a Democrat and be like, what you have to understand is that like 1% of Americans are libertarian. And of those people, only 1% of them understand this shit. The rest of them are fools that don't really understand what's going on. And the most popular ver versions of things that you see are the crazy people that people like to make fun of because that's what goes viral. So let me ask you this, like, you know, you're kind of coming at me with these questions. And, and, and if you don't believe me when I say that that's not true and you've heard other libertarians say it, it's like, okay, but am I to judge all Democrats based off of what Maxine Waters says? You know what I mean? Like that's kind of what you're working with here. So like, I, you know, I'd love to talk about these ideas because there's a lot of people that are mistaken about it and then kind of go into that. Right. That's, that's a good way of looking at it. And basically, you know, I guess kind of jumping off from that idea, you know, there might be some, idea that the government is, you know, required for, you know, the, the protection of the public, for example. Uh, for example, you know, I know California currently is banning red dye number three, you know, from certain, uh, you know, candy items such as Skittles and things like that, simply because mm -hmm. it's been, you know, known to be connected with certain carcinogenic cancers. So some people might say that by, you know, putting that restriction on the marketplace, you know, it's protecting people. You know, they might say that, you know, because we're protecting these people, you know, we're, we're restricting their freedom in that sense, but it's for the greater good. And they're saying that you know, yeah. the free market itself, if left unhindered, would not be able to do that. Now, I, I, and you know, when often I'm when I'm often confronted with you know anti-libertarian arguments, I do have a tendency to fall back on and say, you know, we can leave that to the free market. We can let you know the free market handle this. You know, I think it's a better it it's a better evaluation of supply and demand than we can get mm -hmm. from the state necessarily, but. Uh, basically, from there, like just another example, I've, I've, I've often thought of this one myself when trying to basically almost argue with myself in a sense. Well, you can't leave the other example. I'm... Let me destroy that one. Okay. Go yeah. Ahead. Yeah. Okay. Sure thing. Yeah. Sure thing. <laughs> so, so, so this is this is another. I, I'm not. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in like professor mode. I don't know why yes. to the audience. Mm. I love you guys. I'm mm. in professor mode. So the first thing you want to do is you want to find something that everybody can hate. Okay. This is the first thing you need to do. You need to pull away from the red dye example. First thing you do is admit. Admit when the state is right. Yes, sometimes the state gets things right, but it's always wrong to restrict. Let me explain. Then you move to an example that everybody can hate. The easiest example of government regulation that everybody can hate insofar that I've found is the Food and Drug Administration, right? So first what you do is you establish how horrible the Food and Drug Administration is. If you're talking to a conservative, right, then you talk about the opioid epidemic. You talk about how Purdue Pharma was able to spend money to get a special label, how they lied to doctors, how they committed fraud. Then you talk about um, how 25% of all medications that are on the market, right, are recalled by the FDA because they get it wrong. So it's not even a roll of the dice because they're wrong more often than the dice roll, right? Then you can talk about COVID and lockdowns and and all of the all the things that happen with the vaccine and the vaccine rollout and how the FDA is horrible, right? If you're talking to a lefty, you don't talk about the vaccine because then they bring up Trump, they bring up Project Warp Speed, and they'll say, well, this is, you know, this is a failure because, you know, he removed regulations and the FDA would have done wonderful if not for Trump and Project Warp Speed. What you do instead is you talk about AZT. You talk about the AIDS epidemic. You talk about how homosexual men were killed because the government wouldn't allow them to bring in their own medication that was working in Spain, that was working in other other countries. They wouldn't even allow them to take vitamins. And you bring up and you tell them, go watch the movie Dallas Buyers Club yeah. when you're done with this, right? It's a great movie. Go check it out. So, that, so you can talk to the left and you can talk to the right about the FDA. You can talk about the baby formula, right? 
Uh-huh. And then you explain. You say, yeah, red food, red dye call is a potential carcinogen. No one wants to eat cancer. The market will solve this problem. But let me tell you how the market will solve it. Because what they're doing is when you say the market, you have this unenviable position of doing one of two things. Either you must explain from first principles and the ECP and all these other things that are boring as fuck that no one wants to listen to, or you must present an alternative hypothesis. And that's why you should practice one. I practice the FDA because you have a really good argument about how things would logically occur in the market. And once you've had that well practiced, you can always pivot to that example to show how the system works and then say it would work that way for other things. And so what you do is you talk about um, the FDA. You say, well, look, first thing you do, all you have to do is make it legal to buy insulin, to buy EpiPens, to buy products from other countries. This is when you bring up a failure of the FDA. You, what you save this for the, to explain that step. And you say, hey, the FDA was the one that stopped us from buying baby formula when we had a baby formula shortage from Europe baby formula with less soy and less chemicals that's safer to eat because the FDA said that it didn't have the appropriate labels, even though they've tried in the UK to get that over and over again. And what happened was your beloved president got Connexes and flew them over to Sweden to buy Nestle brand baby formula and then bring that and inject that into the market with your tax dollars. They spent tax dollars to make corporations richer instead of just opening up the market. So you open up the market. Okay, but nobody wants to eat poison and doctors don't want to get sued because they prescribed bad medication. So what happens is companies come along and they say, hey, insurance companies that handle medical malpractice insurance, you give me a little bit of money and I'll investigate products. Or they go to doctors and say, give us a little bit of money and we'll give you a pamphlet that says these medications are good and these medications are not are bad. They start competing in the market. Slowly but surely, this process takes over the FDA and we can just get rid of the FDA. And what you'll have is a competition in the market that's better than all of the other things. It's like, yeah, when you go to the drug, when you go to the, to the, to the grocery store, right? There's going to be a little fucking stamp from a company that you trust or, or a grocery store is going to have a, 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 a company that they trust that vets their food. And it's like one store will say, hey, red food coloring products aren't, aren't allowed because they cause cancer. And another store might sell the shit. And it's up to you to choose, but nobody wants to eat fucking cancer. And so everyone's going to fucking is eventually going to adopt the system that, that, that pulls those products off the market. Instead... What you have is you have companies that spend tons of waste, tons of money researching these things in inefficient ways, drag their feet from stopping these things from occurring and steal the rights of companies to be able to engage in this. So, in fact, you're right. It's a good thing that we're getting rid of red food coloring. And my argument is, is if the FDA didn't exist, we would have gotten rid of it already. Right. Very good. You know, I'm. I'm personally very tired of, you know, capitalism and corporatism being used interchangeably. I know a lot of people who are critical of capitalism will do that. You know, I'm, you know, Chomsky is pretty guilty of this. Uh, I've noticed in a lot of cases. But basically, you know, springing off of that answer, you know, for example, let, let, let's say that there's this type of analogy. Let's say, you know, I wake up one morning, I'm having breakfast cereal, the cereal, but some, but somebody along the production line has poisoned it. So I eat it and next thing I know I'm dead. And it's like, Okay, so from there, you know, we could potentially, you know, press some type of legal repercussions against that, against the company that made that. But in that case, there's still the issue that, I mean, how much damage would that really do to a massive corporation? You know, they'd still be mm-hmm. in more of a position to make an error like that and still continue, you know, they can bounce back from that a lot more easily than somebody who's a smaller, you know, type of business. So, Or, or we could even use a less less extreme example. Let's say instead of just dying, like, let's say there's some piece that ends up breaking one of my teeth or chipping a tooth and I'm unable to get restitution because one of these larger corporations is able to essentially, they have the lawyers, they have the legal sway, the authority that they can use to basically prevent justice in that case. So this is a bit of a, this is a bit of a trick, but you said killed. You didn't say poisoned and they survived. You said killed, right? Okay. Once you say killed, that argument, that's, an, that's the easiest argument to defeat ever. Because then you say, well, the CEO gets killed. That's the restitution for killing someone with a product due to intentional negligence. 
even if it's not intentional negligence, right? If you're guaranteeing that a product is safe and you, and it's not, and it kills people, right? Restitution is a life for a life. And then you bring up Walter Block's argument, right? Which is that, you know, if a machine existed, right? Where someone could walk into the machine and it would take their life, but it would resurrect another person, the CEO of that company, or if you can determine that one person intentionally poisoned a product, right? And like one person was the, 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 whoever it was that caused this poison directly, right? Um, you know, that person can't logically argue that they ought not step into the machine to bring that loved one back to life, right? There, there's no, now, unless, of course, you have, you live in a society or something that has set up an insurance company and there's like an arbitrating firm and you've voluntarily given up that right, right? And then, then, then that's up for the arbitrating firm to determine, you know, like what the value of a, of a life is or, or et cetera, et cetera. But I mean, um, I mean, it, it really just kind of depends upon the legal system that you're set up. Now, if we're talking about not killing someone, right, and just poisoned a bunch of people and all of these medical bills, I, I don't understand the, you know, I would have to understand the mind of the person better to understand what, what they mean. But like, why does it matter if a billion dollar corporation has to pay $20 million in damages and a small business that, that doesn't have the capital to do that? Um, if they don't have the capital to do that, then I have every right to enslave the small business owner, right? And once I enslave the small business owner, they work for me and I, they do whatever the hell I want them to do until they pay restitution and repayment. And so it's in the best interest of the small business owner to have insurance like we have today for lawsuits, right? Like you pay a small amount of money um, and the larger you are as a corporation, the more insurance you pay, right? So it's not like, Large corporations with a lot of capital can afford this just insurance, but small businesses can can't because a large corporation has more risk, right? Like they're 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 dealing with more people, you know. They may have more capital, but they're also more likely to get sued for their products damaging someone. So they're going to pay more in insurance rates than a small business. Really, what it really means, right? The person that's punished is not the corporation with more with with the the company with less money. The person that's most likely to get punished with higher insurance rates, right, is the business that does the most, the least safe maneuvers in the market, right? It is the, it is actually the business that has the lowest safety standards that has the highest potential risk and thus pays the most insurance. So if the large corporation is safer and they take care of their employees better and they put out a safer, better product then I don't mind that they pay less money in insurance than the small business that is less safe and puts out a worse product or a potentially more dangerous product. And if a large corporation wants to cut corners and do an unsafe pro uh, product, well, you know, they might harm more people and therefore they take a much, much larger financial risk either in their insurance payments. Um, and if it's not discovered, um, you know, and they potentially defrauded the insurance, like, you know, like, that's for the legal lease kind of situation to put out. But the way the market actually handles this is that it incentivizes all businesses equally to create the safest product that harms the least amount of people. Whereas our current system of the state incentivizes large corporations to go to politicians and say, here's the rules and here's the things that we like because we can afford these things because we have a large amount of capital and smaller businesses can't afford all of these loopholes. And this will mean that we can raise prices higher than they should be in the market. And we can make things more expensive because we've priced out small businesses out by lines and lines of red tape that we wrote as the experts. And like your Senator doesn't understand like, fucking, you know, the chemical process of waste disposal for insulating in, in plumbing mechanics, right? So they just trust the experts that are all bought off by large corporations. And so that like our current system is the one that actually does that. So I guess my question is, is why are you, why do you love big corporations fucking people over increasing pricing instead of safe, healthy products for everybody where small businesses can thrive? Very good. I mean, that actually also kind of leads me to my next uh, issue here. So basically the topic of, you know, licenses, 
you know, I mean, in this case, I've seen the concept of, you know, state licenses being thrown around a lot, you know. I mean, there's that infamous, you know, libertarian convention where they, they're talking about the driver's license licenses. for your toaster. Yeah, yeah, license for the toaster. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, people might hear hear this thing and they might they might see that and think, oh, those libertarians are just silly. You know, they really obviously, you know, you need licenses. You need licenses for this. You need a license to be a barber, for example. I mean, it's really gets pretty far down the line here. So basically, though. I would say that, you know, the issue with these licenses is that they provide, you know, protectionism to a certain class in society, people who have already received the license, and because of that, they're able to charge higher prices. Uh, and I also think there's more of a Machiavellian nature to it as well, because, you know, when you have this type of licensing system, they're designed more to prevent uh, future, uh, you know, violations occurring, rather than, you know, providing redress for past ones that have already happened. So, so my answer is twofold. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, you. oh, oh no, I'm sorry. So my question was basically, my question was basically, how would licenses actually work in this case? You know, for example, we can, I, I've often thought, you know, if in the case of a barber's license, is it really necessary for them to have a license? I mean, if they're not keeping the place clean, if they're if they're not doing their job properly, if they're like, let's say they're you know trimming somebody's neck and somebody just freaks out and slits somebody's throat, I mean, obvi well, obviously that one would be you know blatant violation of the NAP. But right. but in any case, yep. How would, you know, somebody, you know, address that? I mean, how could we have a system without any occupational licenses in an anarcho-capitalist society, or at least none that are provided by the government? Right. So that's that's the key thing is the aggression, right? So the fact of the matter is, is licenses are never going away and licenses are good. People want licenses. This is such a fucking, like, it's such a poorly miscommunicated thing by libertarians because, yeah. If I'm going to, a, if I'm living in Ancapistan and I go to a barber and a barber has his barber license from a school that he went to, right? Then I know without it, you know, if I trust that school, if I've heard of that school before or, you, you know, or something like that, then I know that that's probably a good, a, a good place for me to get my hair cut, right? Whereas if someone doesn't have a license, then I don't know. It's a mystery. But, you know, my cousin said they got their haircut there and it was a great haircut. And I went online and there was a reviewing system and, you know, they had great reviews online. So I don't give a fuck that they don't have a license, right? The license is providing me information. And that information is, 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 is valuable, right? I information has value because humans are rational actors. We always act within our own rational self-interest. We fail to meet our goals because of information failures in the market, right? We fail to achieve what is in our rational self-interest because we were missing information, either because we're stupid or because there was fraud or because, you know, which is a form of aggression, right? Some coercion or aggression against us. But like, we're always acting in our own self-interest. And so, you know, no one is going to, no one wants a good haircut and then goes somewhere you know, with the intention of getting a bad haircut. Like that's not, human beings do not act that way. It's, it's not possible. Right? It's this theory of human action. And so the, the, the thing about licenses is as a coercion mechanic is that if you want a license, that's fine. Licenses aren't going anywhere. The problem is when you demand a license, what happens when you demand a license? What this is, is this is patronizing and infantilism for the sake of the state and large corporations gaining power. This is big daddy government will protect you dumb, dumb little people that can't go get a haircut or can't get your nails done because you can't be trusted to make informed decisions as a consumer, right? So what we'll do is we'll protect you from the evil nail tech salons that are trying to fuck up your nails with chemicals that are going to burn your fingers because they don't know what they're doing. And you couldn't possibly, oh, I don't know, have friends or use Google to determine where, where a good nail salon is. It's, it's beyond your scope of imagination to Google a local nail salon that has good reviews and go there. It's, it's stupid, right? And so, but when we look at what licenses really do, a great example is Washington, D.C. and medical marijuana licenses. There are two types of individuals that le that are selling marijuana legally in the District of Columbia in the United in the in the nation's capital. There are those that are licensed, and there are those that are unlicensed. The licensed companies sell medical marijuana, and they track everyone that goes in to get medical marijuana, and it's perfectly fine and it's perfectly legal, and they sell marijuana to these people. And then there are other people 
that sell stickers and products and marijuana just happens to be gifted to them for free right now the now the people that sell medical marijuana are constantly lobbying the government to try and shut these gift places out of existence they're doing everything they can to get rid of these people because they can sell marijuana, which is really what they're doing, right? They're not actually selling fucking stickers that come with weed, right? They're selling weed. And they can do it much, much cheaper because it's incredibly expensive to go through all of the legal loopholes um, to get a license to sell. So, but, so why do they exist? Well, the reason they exist is other fucking government regulations. If you have a medical marijuana license, you can't have a security clearance. If you don't have a security clearance... Good luck working in Washington, D.C. All of these people, all of these lawyers, all of these people that work like GS5, GS7, GS11 jobs, you know, for the Social Security Administration, all of these government employees can't get medical marijuana despite their needs. And so they have to buy marijuana via gifting as a means of being able to get marijuana, even though marijuana is legal because they can't have a government position because apparently you're not able to do your fucking paperwork. If you smoke weed at night with dinner, it's, it's incredibly stupid and it makes no fucking sense. Um, but, but, but what you see is you see the class of medical marijuana people constantly petitioning. And what it does is it creates a black market. And the black market is the one that's actually dangerous because companies and citizens can engage in a free market out in the open system where you can trust. And so what you do is you, 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 you create those information failures I was talking about because now you're going to a shady place. You don't know where things are coming from. You can't see large, reputable businesses, you know, supporting them or rating them to determine the safety of the products. You have all these information failures. And so you, you're potentially putting yourself in danger, buying bad products or being defrauded, and you have no mechanism to stop it because the state has created this arbitrary licensing distinction. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's infantilism, it's, it's patronizing, and it's all designed so that certain companies can keep a certain amount of money. And, and, it's, and it's most egregious, honestly, in the American Medical Association and the way that they gatekeep doctors because the way that licensing is occurring with doctors and the way that the AMA has given a monopoly on determining how much water is let through the sieve, which is to say how many doctors are allowed to graduate each year, is artificially reducing the rate of doctors to a point where doctors are really hard to come by and there's no shortage of students with tons of extracurriculars and 4.0s that can't get into a good medical school. Um, and because of this, um, health insurance and, and, health, and, and healthcare costs are skyrocketing. When really we should have probably double the doctors that we have now, and we should have much, much, much lower rates for insurance and going to the doctor's office and things like that. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it's, it's the, the licensing system is disgusting, but licenses aren't going anywhere. Right. That's a good way of looking at it. You know, I've, I've always thought, you know, voluntary certification is superior to an actual, you know, required license, you know, and if we take yeah, and if we same take, difference. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If we take a look at, you know, other types of licenses, such as, you know, a driver's license, you know, a fishing license, a hunting license. What I've noticed about those particular cases is they almost come down to land ownership issues here. You know, I, my logic on that is why should the state be the ones who give out driver's licenses? Why should they be the ones in charge of hunting licenses yeah. or fishing licenses? Because I don't think they've legitimately established ownership of the roads or of the hunting grounds or of, or of the bodies of water in this case. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, the, the long story short for driver's license, right, real quick, like, what would likely occur is insurance companies would issue driver's licenses as part of their package of being your insurance provider. Right. And you don't need a driver's license. Right. The, the simple fact of the matter is, is that the overwhelming majority of privatized roads will just require that you have car insurance. And when you go to get car insurance, they'll be like, look, it, we're going to charge you $600 a month. But if you go take this class and you get certified as a driver, we'll charge you a hundred dollars a month. And so people will just go take the fucking class get certified, get a cheaper insurance rate, proving their competency with a vehicle, right? And, and what'll be funny, what'll really be funny is that we'll, the market will determine the cheapest available um, system at the, at the it will determine the, the appropriate equilibrium, which is to say some insurance companies will have defensive driving classes that are like 10 times harder than, than what like police officers get. And some 
will have bullshit driving classes that anybody could pass. And the ones that do really rigorous shit, probably Geico, if you know anything about the insurance industry, Geico does crazy. They're really by the book type people. We'll figure out which one's better. The market will determine who, by, by what profit is, is it better to have a really, really strict driver's license situation with really low insurance rates because you can ensure that all of your drivers are really good drivers that really pay attention? Or is it better to charge more money and give a bullshit thing to everybody and just have a larger consumer base? The market will figure that out. Right. Yes. So, I mean, in relation to, you know, voluntary certifications, though, I mean, one argument I've, I've had with somebody, you know, about they were talking about, you know, restaurants, you know, who's going to provide health and how are the health inspectors going to come in? You know, if the restaurant isn't, you know, this is, you know, this is pretty reminiscent of, I think, some of the other arguments I've made so far. But basically, mm-hmm. they talk about, you know, if the if they fail the inspection, you know, they then they shouldn't be in business. They should be closed. Even though, you know, when they talk about the meeting a certain threshold of quality, it's like, you know, who really meet, meet sets that threshold anyway. It's just one state's, you know, level of quality that basically everybody has to, you know, meet in the marketplace. But basically what I'm saying. So real quick, I, real quick. Okay. You just asked this question real quick. Sure. When, when you're looking for when you're looking for a fucking restaurant. Are you are you are you going to the restaurant physically and looking for the posted fucking health rating or are you looking on. A, a, a review website. No, nobody gives a fuck about the health rating. And if you go to New York City, for example, all of those fucking restaurants are disgusting, right? Like you're just <laughs> look, you're just going online and you're just googling and being like, oh, this says like a, a four point seven rating. Everybody says it's good, and you go through the reviews and nobody said they got sick, so you go there. It's unnecessary. That, uh, I- yeah, that actually answered my very next question, which was I was saying, you know, talking to somebody about how, OK, they could provide, you know, some type of, you know, ranking of, you know, if they've been accredited by some type of voluntary certification company, they could potentially use that as part of advertising. This person responded to me saying that, you know, people are so stupid, you know, they aren't going to be able to think like that. They essentially need an expert to come in and make these decisions for them. I mean, we've, we've kind of already gone over that. Wait, wait, it, the, the real answer is, is that that agency would lower their insurance costs. It's not that it wouldn't it wouldn't give a fuck to the day to day consumer. They don't care. They're just going to look for a good restaurant and hope they don't get sick. And they're going to look for one with good ratings. And like people that get people sick all the time or are gross or like the service sucks will go out of business. Right. Because they can't compete against people that are doing the doing the right job. Right. But but voluntarily having your place inspected will almost certainly like, you know, one of the things that's really important to understand as a lib- libertarian is you ought to have a conversation. Everyone needs to have a conversation with someone that works as an insurance underwriter, because that will help you understand how libertarianism will work in a way that nobody else has. I really wish there was a book I could point people to. I don't know one of them. It's just I've known people in the insurance industry and I've had a lot of conversations with underwriters. But like underwriters, basically what they do as an ins- as an insurance in insurance is when you call someone to to um to talk to an insurance company, you're talking to someone that handles cases. Well, there's a whole other side of the insurance agency that private citizens or citizens that aren't business owners never deal with. And these are the guys that sit somewhere and they determine how much it's going to cost for you to insure your business. And they look at your health inspection records. They look at the fire department records. They look at crime statistics in the area. They look at like photos of your building. Sometimes they go out to your building and then they determine how much it's going to cost you to be insured by them because they're determining your risk. Right. And this is going to exist in libertarianism just like it exists today. And so the the real answer is, is if you're in, if you're a company and you're a restaurant and nobody has rated you for health, the insurance underwriter is going to be like, I don't feel comfortable giving you insurance go get rated by a company with health. And then I want there. here's three companies I'll accept, pick one. I don't care. And then fax me or email me their records so I can look at that so I can accurately assess the risk. And then the fucking restaurant will. And then if you don't do it again for two years, the insurance underwriter will write in your fucking contract, say, you know, every year that you don't do this, it goes up 70%. And then you'll agree to get it inspected. Like this will happen all behind the scenes. You don't need government to do this. Insurance companies will do this. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, if we take a look at banks, for example, you know, I mean, are they going to are they going to provide a business loan to a business that hasn't received any, you know, type of, you know, accrediting right. or some type of certification for that? Exactly. Now, I just want to kind of pivot for a second and 
you know, talk about a figure I really, really hate, and that is Sam Cedar. So basically, you know, there was one particular, you know, interview he had that kind of caught my attention where he was talking with Daryl Perry, uh, you know, the libertarian. So mm. basically, you Actually, know, I haven't seen that one, but I watched okay. another one and reacted. It's on my channel. It's, sure. it's, a, it's a, he, he's, he's a fucking art. But go ahead. Yes. Yes. So I'll so basically to break down what happened in this pretty infamous debate, uh, they were having their conversation. And then, so then Sam Cedar basically asked Daryl Perry, you know, how someone could prove that their land was their land. So Perry replied that, you know, they would have some type of property deed. You know, Cedar asked, well, who would issue the property deed? And, you know, Perry then said, you know, they would most likely be competing agencies that would issue the deed. So then Cedar asked, OK, which one of the issues would be the which one of these agencies would be the one that actually issues the deed. And then Perry kind of completely blew it at that point and became some screaming wreck. But basically, basically I feel like if we look at what Sam Cedar was actually arguing for there, I mean, it's like, I mean, is this guy really saying that the only way we can have legitimate property rights is for the government to seize all of the property and then to just give itself the final say on who gets to own what? Cause I mean, like these people can laugh at Daryl Perry for kind of fumbling that question but their own answer to this question is definitely worse. So it kind of reminds me of like basically what happened there. It almost reminds me of, you know, when you might have a four year old who keeps asking why to every question. So you might say like, OK, well, this would do it. Well, why, why, why? And then eventually, let's say, you know, you might get to the point where, say, why, why is this your property? It's like, well, because the government says so. And then, you know, the natural question that would be, well, why is that? But the problem is that Sam Cedar and his people are basically stopping the line of questioning right there and saying, OK, that works for me, you know, rather than trying to recognize, could it be that this, giving the states the final say so on property rights is, you know, a mistake in the first place? You know, I don't see why you need, you know, one centralized monopoly there to determine who was allowed to possess what. But basically, uh, so Scott, I mean, in, I was going to ask, how would we be able to determine who officially owns what without the state? OK, so so in the example, what, what you're saying is, is I own a house and I have a property deed. Right. And some company has certified this property and someone else comes along with a different company that has certified the property deed in their name. Right. So I'm person A and then there's person B. Person A has company A. So there's person A, company A, person B, company B. Person A has a property deed to 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 the house um, certified by company A. Person B is a property deed um, certifying person B. Okay, so, so how do we resolve this issue? Well, this issue occurs now with the government, right? Like this, this isn't, this, this occurs with, with, with disputes on property lines all of the fucking time, right? W which is someone builds a privacy fence, someone gets a surveyor out um, because they want to build something on their house at some point, And then they're like, hey man, did you know that your privacy fence is actually six inches into the other person's property? And the other person now actually technically owns this. And so what the state does is the state has these arbitrary distinctions that occur and simply say, it's kind of like squatters rights, which is to say, you can't build the privacy fence on someone else's property immediately. But if you discover 10 years later that your privacy fence has been on their property all along, well then it magically becomes your property, right? And, and this is a way to avoid the, the problem of, let's say, your neighbor having a surveyor come out one day and because of six fucking inches of land that they never knew was theirs to begin with um, is tech has the has the privacy fence. You know, they come and they just demolish your privacy fence, you know, just because and then they just laugh at you and be like, ha ha ha, no privacy for you. I never wanted a privacy fence. It's just stop petty disputes um, for, for these minor things. Right. So. Company A says, you know, well, this house is yours. And company B says this house is person B. So how do we resolve this situation? Well, whenever there's conflict, whenever, so so what is conflict, right? Conflict, as far as the libertarian view is concerned, in, in terms of argumentation ethics, right? Backing that up to, to understand what is occurring is when two people want to use scarce mean, uh, scarce resources to opposing means, Right. One person A wants to live in the house. Person B wants to live in the house. There's only one fucking house, right? So we have to determine who actually owns the house. Now, there's an objective reality there. One person actually owns the house, right? There is a fact of the universe, if you will, a fact of logic, right? And, and, and that logic is, is that one person is the legitimate property owner. And the reason they're the legitimate property owner is because they 
Um, you know, they, they legitimately purchase the house from someone all the way down a chain of events that eventually leads to someone going to that land and bordering that land, communicating to those around them that this is their land, and then fitting that land to their will and purpose and eventually building a house upon it. The last, the last element may or may not be necessary, depending on what philosophical approach you take, right? Um, but nevertheless, like all of those things were clearly done in the event of a house being built, right? So even the, un, the, the potentially unnecessary element was achieved. And so if objective reality says that there is one person that is a house and that, you know, when that conflict is occurring, well, there's only two ways that you can solve this. You can do so via argumentation. You can do so via violence, right? And when, if violence is used, only one person in this, in this instance is justified in using violence against the other person. That is the person that is the legitimate property owner, right? Now, both of these companies right, exist in a state where they both could choose to gamble to go to war over this property. They both could send in the police and then the police could start killing each other. And then like they could set up a defensive perimeter and whichever fucking company warlord wins is the one that wins because might doesn't make right, but it does make reality. But in doing so, both companies also recognize that they are taking a huge risk, which is that unless they are absolutely certain without any shadow of a doubt that their client is the one that is the legitimate property owner, if other observers and other people determine that they committed an act of aggression, that they were actually not the legitimate property owners, then all of the actions that they did are a form of aggression. So when they came in and they sent in their police and they killed a couple people in order to secure this property, they've murdered multiple people. And that means that that company is, is liable for the same punishment a serial killer is liable for, right? Which is the whole company is dissolved and everybody's killed in the company. And so we end up in this Hatfields and McCoy situation. Now, this is the lie that the status wants to tell you, is that it requires a state intervention to stop the Hatfield and McCoy situation. But when you live in a libertarian, eth uh, when, when a society is based predominantly on a libertarian ethos, which is necessitated for the libertarian society to exist in the first place, because they'll be like, well, what if some people don't? Well, yes, yeah, some people won't. There will always be criminals. But obviously, a majority of the society believes in these things, at least to some degree, or there would be a state if they did. Right. So the, the, the fact that you're giving an example of a stateless society that exists in this in this situation is that they almost always will choose voluntary action. They will almost always always choose that this will occur. And they almost certainly already have mechanisms for this very situation. And what that means is that company A and company B will come together. They'll say, hey, look, I don't want to murder you. You don't want to murder me. Let's figure this out because I don't want to take the risk. You don't want to take the risk. Let's both agree to go to a third party arbitration system. And then they go to the third party arbitration system. They review the evidence. Both clients agree, right? Both clients, or at least both companies that are representing their clients agree on an arbitrator that they believe to be fair. And, and people, and you know, and I know Sam Cedar's argument right after that, it's like, well, who's the, the biggest one is the one that'll help the big companies. And it's like, no, the biggest one is the one that tends to be the most fair and avoids the most violence because if people, that's how that works. So the most efficient, most effective, most efficient, most likely to ascertain the truth is the one that is the most likely to stay in business. So a system that is better based upon market systems at ascertaining the truth than the state is. It has to be because the market will almost always be will always be better in this situation because of the competitor. So a more fair system than the state can provide will arbitrate between these two people. They'll come to an agreement. And because their clients are represented by these companies that have these deeds and because those companies agree to that arbitration, if you lose, you lose. And there's nothing you can really do about it. Now, you might be able to appeal. You might be able to get some other representation, et cetera, but you're going to have to pay for that. Um, and that's no different than civil court court proceedings today where the rich might be able to get several appeals, et cetera. Uh, and the poor simply can't afford it unless they have a really good case and some lawyer is willing to go pro bono. Nice. Yes. I, I definitely agree with that, but that does lead to me to my next question here, which is really, you know, how could a privatized justice system work exactly as far as, you know, not just the courts, but as far as prisons and, you know, police and things like that, because I've noticed that 
you know, police are often hated in society. And I, there's probably, I think there's some justification behind that as well. Um, but so basically police are the lifeblood of the state. I've noticed, you know, I mean, without them, you know, the state wouldn't really have any authority. I mean, you know, yeah. without figures who can enforce government decrees, I mean, what, what are politicians going to do? I mean, is Nancy Pelosi just going to come to your doorstep and whack her finger in your face, just insisting like, give me half your paycheck or, or something like that. I mean, it's just not realistically going to happen, but Basically, we could also talk about private security as an alternative to an actual, you know, pol you know, police force here. And mm -hmm. what I've heard in that case is some people have tried to respond to that saying that what's going to stop somebody like Jeff Bezos, for example, you know, coming along with, you know, his outrageous amount of wealth and, you know, simply bribing your, you know, private security to stand down and let him, you know, aggress upon you. So what would, what would be the, you know, response to that exactly? Well, my response to that is, do you rent? Oh, you own your own home. Okay, cool. How many people rent in this country? How, renting is pretty normal, right? Well, renters don't own the property. Renters own multiple properties. Some of them, some of them own big apartment complexes. But the majority of people that 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 are landlords are actually middle class. The overwhelming majority of properties that are rental properties are middle class people. Because, you know, People like to think that landlord is like this class because they have this Marxian propagandized idea when really what most landlords in this country are, are middle class people whose like grandpa died and left them the house. And now they have like another house. And sometimes they'll, it's too much work and they'll give it up. But more often than not, they give it to a company to manage or they, you know, and they rent it in some capacity. That's how people become landlords is like grandpa died, gave my house. They don't know what to do with it. So they rent it. Right. Um, because they don't necessarily want to live in, in that house that was given to them because it's not where their job is or it's not, you know, it's not a convenient location for schools or whatever, whatever reason. Right. So landlords, well, landlords want to protect their property. And so if there are no police, then landlords will need police. Right. And so people like to think of it as like everybody owns this private property and then like the community has to come together with a local police force and, you know, Bezos Corp police you, you know, will come in. It's like, no, dude, it's going to be a bunch of fucking landlords, most of whom are middle class, agree to use a company. And like, and, and, and for, 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 for sake of e for, for ease of access, they'll probably all utilize the same company or they'll be competing companies. And those companies will not be able to work if there's, let's say, 10 companies and they don't have a right to move in certain areas of the city. Well, they'll all be gridlocked. None of them will be able to do anything. You'll have like a bunch of defunct competing police uh, police agencies. So in order for the police to actually be able to sell their service to people, they'll go to their competition and say, hey, look, I have an agreement that you, you know, that everyone that signs up for your police force, I'm allowed to cross your property if I'm chasing a criminal or if I'm doing something and you can do the same with mine, right? So all the police people that are competing will come together and be like, look, you manage this property, I manage that property, but I still get to go through your property to stop a criminal. So you have competing police agencies within, let's say, a, an urban environment. Um, that's how that really works, right? Like it's it's not like it's not like Daddy Bezos has a big private army and nobody else can support policing. It's like you you pay a fucking Netflix subscription, except instead of Netflix, it's a fucking police prescription, and it costs more for high crime areas and it costs less for low crime areas. And the thing is, is that high crime areas tend to be mostly rental properties. So what you're actually talking about is a progressive system of policing where the people who pay the most are the landlord class. These are the people that are going to be paying the most for fucking for, for security and policing is the landlord class, the rentiers, right? So if you're a fucking commie that hates this concept so much, like, I don't know why, because it's the landlords that are going to have to fucking pay. And so you have a community of multiple competing police agencies that are not incentivized to go to war with each other ever, because doing so means that another force can come in, call them the aggressor, and then get rid of them and also get rid of their policing competition. Right. So it would be really easy for them to do that. So it behooves police interests, uh, police agencies to be real careful about doing anything violent against other police agencies because it's always going to be a gamble that they're the aggressor and that they may have to pay with massive amounts of money or potentially even their own lives for committing crimes that they didn't know that they were committing. And so, you know, 
when you compare that to a state agency where the landlord class is really just middle class and they don't have a lot of sway with the government like you actually think they do, who really has sway with the government is the prison military industrial complex and the prison, the, the, the for pri- the private Right. Big, big air quotes here. If you're listening audio only, yeah, the private funded. prison industry, right, is supporting this bullshit war on drugs to go into communities and destroy them over and over again, taking fathers away from homes, perpetuating the very crime, doing all of these things that the people that are the middle class landlord class, right, are the people that don't want. They want a safer community because that means lower prices. On, on terms of like policing, lower prices in terms of other things, it means that the property value goes up. They're incentivized to reduce crime and to make the neighborhood a better, safer place with better schools because they own property there, right? But it's the prison industry and it's large corporations that are profiting off of putting 25% of the world's populate, prison population in jail for bullshit war on drugs and things like that. So, I mean... The police do not have a constitutional uh, uh, duty to protect. Multiple Supreme Court cases have affirmed this. And yet private police that sign a contract with you have a contract obligation to protect whatever property or persons they're contracted to protect. And so you have a system where the police work for the state and work for big corporations and don't have any constitutional duty to protect versus a system that works for property owners, works for the middle class, works, they're incentivized to make the neighborhood cleaner and safer and and less crime and better for business, and they're incentivized to actually protect its citizens. I don't even understand how one makes an argument that 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 the the, the current system of policing is is somehow preferable to a privatized police system. Right, exactly. That actually reminds me of a conversation I had with someone about, you know, and this person, I don't know if they were really the brightest person because they were talking about, you know, the idea, I've saw, you know, the idea of a privatized fire department and they're talking about, oh, oh what's going to happen? Is your house going to be on fire? And then the co- the firefighters will just show up and be like, oh, you know, pay right now before we start putting this fire out. And it's like that, that I mean, it's like you schmuck. There's a, you know, much more of a free market, you know, solution to that. Whereas, for example, it could be part of an insurance company's, you know, as a monthly premium. I mean, I know there are private insurance, there are private fire companies that do that, you know, where they will essentially, you know, pay, charge on a monthly basis. And then in case there's something like that, then they come right out and do it from there. Or they might actually just charge, you know, retroactively after the fire's put out. So, I mean, I don't see mm-hmm. why, you know, why somebody would be looking so, at the free market in such a rigid sense. So that actually happened in the UK. And there is myths that are completely unsourced myths of police agents, uh, of fire departments in the UK before it was nationalized, um, letting buildings burn. And there's a video from a, like a YouTube historian guy where he basically put out an apology video because he looked deeper into it. And what he discovered when he hired researchers and stuff was that this myth is based entirely off of the second or third fire department to show up to a building when another fire department had already beat them to the building and they would no longer be able to claim the profits from that building. They had mutual contracts that the first person to show up would be the one to put it out, even if there was a competition amongst them. It was better. And also they're incentivized to stop fires because fires spread. And so if a fire isn't put out in one building, even if you don't pay, right, it's kind of a the free the free rider problem, right? Which is that like, you know, if, if, if one building... E- you could you could potentially get away with not paying for fire insurance with or, or fire uh, things like that because a company is going to put out the fire because they don't want to the fire to spread to the next building that they do insure right so the, it, it would really only make sense in like way out in the country that a fire department wouldn't put out your your fire if you don't pay um, because at least in that terms of incentive but also just like you mentioned what they would do is they would just retroactively um, they would retroactively um, charge people. And the thing about the retroactive charge is an interesting thing because I don't think that actually follows the, the non-aggression principle. I don't think that you can perform a service for someone. Actually, I don't, I, I'm not even going to use the word think. I know you can't. You can't right. put out a fire and then charge someone for putting out the fire um, in your building unless there was a potential risk from that fire, right? So, for example, if you're in a city and my building is next to you, I have to put out that fire 
or else it's going to spread. It's no different than you holding a gun with your finger and the trigger will at me. You know what I mean? At any moment, the trigger, you might pull the trigger. Like you're, you're holding the gun to the building next to you and that that building might cause. So you could do that in that instance. But again, out in the country, um, it is very possible that uh, a fire company would not come if you're not there, if you're not their provider. Um, but out in the country is all volunteer fire departments that take a half hour, 45 minutes to get to your, sh- to get to your place anyways, under the system of statism that we have. So there's no meaningful distinction there anyways. Um, so yeah. So, I mean, we had an example from history. It was cheaper. It was better. It was more effective and less buildings burned down. Um, and then the state came in because they wanted to nationalize it. And all they've done is fuck it up ever since. Right. You know, I mean, I'm pulling, I'm, you know, pulling my interest from, you know, I've sit, I've John Stossel had an interview uh, with somebody who was running some type of privatized fire department, you know, and to be fair, I want to say when he, when they paid afterwards, I meant that, you know, the price itself had been agreed upon in advance, you know, as, but they just chronologically didn't, you know, request funds from them until after, you know, that prior. Yeah, 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 sorry. Amount. Yep. Okay. True. But yes. So from here, I mean, I want to talk about kind of an issue that is considered a bit of a sticky one, the issue of health care exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, so basically, you know, I've heard people say, you know, in a very matter of fact sense that, you know, healthcare cannot work in a free market. And, you know, they'll be saying that, you know, because of, you know, the fact that the public has to survive, they're going to be much more forced to pay, you know, these exorbitant prices. And I think a lot of this also comes down to issues surround, surrounding, you know, intellectual property, you know, kind of restricting marketplace competition to an extent. Mm-hmm. But overall, I suspect there could very well be more to the issue than just that. So I was curious what your take on that would be exactly. Well, what I would say is that we had a we had a better version of healthcare. Um, obviously, technological innovations change things, right? Um, and this better version of healthcare gave power to the lower class and the elites um, destroyed this system of healthcare. Um, the fraternal so that, lodge. Yeah, the lodge system, yeah. the fraternal lodge system. Um, was was as such that, you know, poor people collectively got together, paid monthly services and fees so that they could have access to doctors. And then poor people started telling rich, educated, elite people that they weren't good enough and that other doctors were better. And so they no longer required their services and they were able to work in a competitive market to get the best doctors available. Uh, and they and they even voluntarily agreed to progressive systems. Right. Um, I would also note that insurance is actually be, the Christians, hilariously enough, the, the Christian conservatives are doing this as well, where instead of working for a pro, instead of having private insurance, what they do is they have progressive insurance systems where, you know, they work off of the concept of being my brother's cre- keeper. And it's a very socialistic, but it's perfectly free market. So I don't care where a bunch of Christians get together and rich people pay a little bit more and poor people pay a little bit less. And then when there's something like a heart transplant or something really serious, they basically set up like an internal GoFundMe that says, Hey, Sarah in Tennessee, you know, needs a heart transplant and it's going to cost $12 million. And like, you know, we only cover this amount. Like, can anybody chip in? Let's, let's, let's save Sarah's life. Right. And so people that can, so it's actually a combination of, of free market and socialist co-op and mutual aid and praxis all working together in a voluntary means. And it's superior to the health insurance industry, right? When people hear free market, they hear capitalism, poor people get fucked, rich people do well. When really what it means is voluntary transactions to help each other out or to help yourself in any means that you voluntarily choose to do so. And the Christians have proved that there are superior models that are socialist models, um, but they're not they're not coerced and they're not using the government. They're, they're purely voluntary and they're based as fuck. Um, so, yeah, so I would say that, you know, and I, and I mentioned the AMA and the licensing before and, you know, the way that health insurance is, is, is worse. Also, there's this, you know, certificate of need boards, right? Many hospitals want to build new hospital wings, but legally aren't allowed to until they pay like millions of dollars in having the community come to them and, you know, red tape and having these meetings and having meetings with politicians and, you know, having all of these other business interests come in and all these things before they're legally allowed to build an addition to their hospital. And this is in like half the states in America. It's in, it's insane. The state has destroyed the system. Now, what they're talking about is in a purely private system, you could deny people care. And the government has it said that emergency care ought not be denied. And so this is this is the real crux. This is what they're really talking about, right? 
and, and this is the minarchist in them is like, sure, sure, sure. There's all these ineffective things, but at the end of the day, if it's purely free market, I could go to a hospital and when I get to the hospital, they say, Oh, you don't have this insurance or you don't have this leave. I'm going to let you bleed out in the lobby. And that's true. And that's their right to do so. It's a hard bite. It's a hard bullet to bite, but they have every right to do so. But just imagine for a moment, a hospital that is, is going to be based in part from charitable donations. You know, a, a hospital works, lives and breathes, not just by insurance and people paying for their services, but it also lives and breathes by charity. Charity work is a big component to healthcare because people feel that it's so necessary. The moment you turn away someone that's bleeding to death in your lobby because they don't have insurance is the moment every charity organization that works with you is going to pull the fuck out because they don't want to be associated with the money that you're giving to help people going to an institution that lets people bleed out in their fucking lobby. Right. And so there's very, very little incentive for somebody to, for somebody to do that. Now that still may exist, right? There still may be, you know, that still may exist in some capacity and to, and to an extent that kind of already exists today, right? If you drive to a plastic surgeon's office with a gunshot wound, you know, Legally, they'll, they'll help you get to a hospital, but it's not like they're fucking taking care of you there or anything, right? Like, like, and so, you know, they'll do their best, you know, good Samaritan, but in, in many ways they're not required to fucking operate on you or anything like that because they simply don't have the means to do so. So yes, it will occur that there will be some instances in a free market system where someone is dying and they are turned away and told, get wrecked, Keck W, and, 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 and they just let them die elsewhere. The, the the thing is, is that it is your responsibility to ensure that you have insurance for these situations, to ensure that you have voluntarily engaged with someone previous, uh, sorry, prior to being in an emergency situation that covers you in those emergencies. It is not someone else's duty to be enslaved to the circumstances of other people. This is this is insane because the natural in conclusion to this is full blown communism. Right. Like once you say it is OK to enslave one person's labor to another person's, you know, positive rights of like an ability to, to get food or an ability to get health care is the moment that, that you start negotiating with slavers. And, and this is this is is wrong. But a free market system is not going to have have situations like that. Like those situations are going to be so fucking rare because they're so disincentivized that they're almost comical to bring up. And, and, and they're at a level of absurdity where it's equally legitimate for me to bring up things like, oh, I don't know, the Catholic surgery wants to do an experimental procedure on a young boy. And the UK government says he's almost certainly going to die on the airplane ride. So therefore, we're going to put police outside of the hospital and stop the parents from coming to see their dying child because we've determined that he needs to die now. That's also an extreme circumstance. It's not a common thing that happens, right? It's not fair to say that this happens all the time under like the NIH or something, right? But they're equally, they're equal ends of the distribution in terms of their absurdity and their likelihood of occurring. The only difference is, is that mine entails freedom and the dangers of mine is this incredibly rare, bad thing happening. And, and, and this is somehow a weakness to the system, but there's no danger of slavery happening in mine and yours has it baked in. Very, very well put. Yes. I mean, even in this case, you know, talking about people just being turned away and dying, I mean, even if they may have the right to do that, that doesn't mean that the act of doing that in itself is, you know, moral or a good thing to do by any means. You know, I think. Yeah, no. Yeah. You know, people would pull out, but also like in a hospital full of doctors, someone in my chat mentioned, it's true. Like in a hospital full of doctors, like what what is the fucking likelihood that a hospital full of doctors won't be like bring him in let's pull the gunshot one out it's like that's their job it's what they do there's there's i'm sure there's the there's the few surgeons that turn out to be doctor strange right that are like oh he doesn't have money let him bleed like that's just not a fucking common thing amongst doctors right i mean i i think the idea of you know people just medical personnel just stepping over somebody who's just bleeding to death you know realistically is you know pretty silly 
But, and it's know. also just not in their rational self-interest, right? You're not going to be able to get jobs at places. You're going to lose charity and you're going to lose money by doing that. Honestly, like it's just the only person that would do that is both a psychopath and an idiot and also is a doctor. And like, and there has to be, there has to be like a critical mass of them all in the hospital of people with medical degrees that are stupid and sociopaths. Like it's a one in a million situation. Mm-hmm. Right, exactly. So in this case, you know, this also kind of reminds me of another question I've had, you know, a content conversation I've had with one of my employees, you know, I'm not my employee, my coworker, uh, who was just a very, very leftist guy, um, you know, so I was basically telling him about, you know, he's not how would, you know, unemployment work, for example, and I said, you know, it could be provided, you know, privately in a sense through the free market. I mean, even these fraternal lodges could provide something akin to that. And he said, well, the problem with that is there could be stipulations to which I say there absolutely should be stipulations to unemployment in some sense, other, you know, compared to the system that we have now where it's right. basically just given out, you know, willy nilly. Um, and I think it's just a huge waste of resources that way. So basically, as far as, you know, welfare or unemployment, I mean, what, what do you think would be the best structural system for that? Um, so the thing is, is that unemployment is calculated in the is already calculated psychologically in the negotiate in the current wage negotiations with your employer. And it's calculated not just psychologically, but literally companies pay unemployment insurance when they hire an employee, which means that they by definition, when you get when you get a job for twenty dollars an hour, part of that part of that is that the the employer knows that they have to pay like 10% of your wages in unemployment insurance. So you're getting hired for $22 an hour, but they're paying you $20 an hour. And then they're paying an insurance company $2, sorry, they're paying an insurance to the state, right? Monopoly on that, right? $2 an hour so that the state can withhold, so that the state can pay unemployment insurance and you're being taxed for that very, very same thing, right? So a lot of people don't realize this, the taxes that come out of your paycheck, your employer's paying almost as much taxes on your paycheck. So when you see your paycheck and you're getting paid $20 an hour, for example, let's make it easy. We'll do $10 an hour, right? And 30% of your wages are getting taxed, right? Or we'll say 20%, right? Because $10 is not that much. So you're only take, your take home pay is like $8 an hour, assuming you didn't get overtime or anything, right? Let's not overly complicate it. It's not that the employer is paying $10 and then you're paying $2 in taxes. The employer is paying $12. They're paying $2 in taxes and you're paying $2 in taxes, right? And so you're like, well, what will we do without unemployment? It's like, well, you'd be making, instead of making $20 an hour, you'd be making fucking $30 an hour, right? So first of all, you'd be making way more money if unemployment didn't exist. Or your employer, in competition with other people, for the same position might go, you know what I could do? I bet instead of offering someone $30 an hour, I can offer them benefits and I can actually save money on these benefits because employers are too lazy to go to Aflac or to go to some other insurance provider, right? And do this because they feel they need the job. So what I'll do is I'll actually, my, my, my competitor is offering $30 an hour. But what I'll do is I'll offer $25 an hour, but I'll have health insurance and I'll have dental and I'll have unemployment insurance and I'll look like the good guy. I'll look like the guy that's providing, that's really taking care of my employees, right? But I'm only paying $3 an hour for this stuff. And I'm actually saving $2 an hour because I can do it on mass and I've figured out a way to make it cheap. And I've, I'm selling it to this person in like a way that really makes them to want. And so the employer that can charge, tw- that can pay you $25 an hour plus dental, plus eye care, plus health insurance, plus unemployment insurance, and can actually overall pay a little bit less than the person that they're, that they're in competition with, right, can get better employees and can beat out that person in the market in terms of their product because they have better employees, And so the question then comes down to a voluntary action. Do you want $30 an hour and then you yourself go and get Aflac in the case that you lose your job or something, you get a big payout until you can find the next job? Or do you simply go to an employer that offers you $25 an hour? It's not quite as much money, but you don't have to worry about any of that shit. What is the worry and what is the managing your bank account and all these fucking subscriptions worth to you? For some people... 
that are penny pinchers. They're like, fuck you. I'll balance my own checkbook. I'll go get $30 an hour and I will go and get all of these things and cover my ass and I'll make, you know, a dollar and four cents more than I would at the other company per hour. And I've figured it all out and I have no problem, you know, every week sitting down with the checkbook and making sure everything gets paid. And then other people don't want any of that stress. And that stress to them is, is worth, it's worth a dollar for losing a dollar for an hour, dollar and four cents an hour to not worry about any of that shit and have it all signed out in the contract. Welfare is different because welfare isn't necessarily dependent upon you having a job, but unemployment is a non-issue from people that simply don't understand econ and don't understand the employer employee relationship. I could give you the answer. I have a video called the Richmond trade association, (laughs) right? Where I talk about how, where I go through like a 30 minute thing on how it could actually be profitable to create an insurance company. TLDR. If you want more details, watch that. It's an old video. So some of my libertarian theory is a little bit off, but it's still, I think it still holds up. Um, Basically, it's very easy for a company to come in and to sell morality. Morality is something that has value. And so what you do is you set up a company that's a charitable organization, right? Except there's no NGOs in Ancapistan, right? Because there's no government, right? And so there's no distinction between a private company and a charity company. So you go to places and you go, hey, look, we donate money um, to, you know, we pool together money. To the, towards the local soup kitchen, right? So that the so that the homeless people can deal with the soup kitchen can have food, right? Um, will you give us money? If you give us money, we have this really cool logo that you can put on your sign in your shop, right? And this and this is just like it shows that you donated to Doctors Without Borders. Now the private company is sitting there going, well. I don't want a bunch of homeless people begging outside the back of my fucking restaurant for food. So yeah, it behooves me both to look good to other people and to be one of the good guys, but it also behooves me doubly to clean up the fucking people that are coming around my backyard and giving them a place to eat. I can drive them out and be like, Hey fuckers, I donated to the local soup kitchen. Get the fuck off my property and go get food there. Right? So now you, you, you start taking in donations and then you grow. Well, how do you grow? Well, next, your company sets up a food festival, a folk festival, maybe. You sponsor some 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 local events. You have music, you have food, you gain money. Everybody goes for a good cause. The money goes to charity, right? You reiterate this process. Now, all of a sudden, the more charity you do, the more valuable it is to have that sign in the window because it's more recognizable as this place that helps clean up the community, right? And helps people out. And then maybe you build a house to house homeless people and help them out. Maybe you build a school to like teach them how to do like, I don't know, electrical engineering or some not electrical engineering, but like be an electrician. Right. And you keep doing that and you keep growing and you keep getting better and better. You keep taking more and more money. And then, then you do the shit that nobody likes that the elites do. Right. Which is you set up business meetings and like, it's valuable to go to these business meetings because like certain companies that have excess capital are the ones that can donate to charity, which means those are the businesses that really know what they're doing. You start setting things up. You reiterate this process over and over and over again, and you can create large companies that are for profit that are based upon cleaning up your community because it behooves the community. It behooves businesses both to help clean up the community, but it gets rid of the free rider problem because you're selling your charitability um, to the consumer and there's a lot of there's a lot of Karens out there that walk through town shopping and see that and like, oh, that's so nice. And it draws their attention and it might make them buy products. There there that's are right. ways to do it that aren't just simply praxis. But also, fuck you, if you're a commie, like you should believe in praxis anyways. Nobody's stopping you. Right, exactly. Yes. So I guess to kind of lean back, you know, I'm more of a to go back to more of a approaching this from a philosophical way, you know, a lot of the times when I'll be trying to discuss anarcho-capitalism with somebody, you know, I'll be talking about the philosophies, you know, the NAP, different ideas such as that. And, you know, a lot of people, they just don't seem to understand it. Like one of my favorite criticisms I get from people that just cracks me up is when they say, you know, I'm not interested in philosophy or theory. I'm interested in the real world, which Mm -hmm. in itself, I would say is a performative contradiction because you're basically saying there that I live by the philosophy that I don't live by philosophy. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's virtually impossible not to live according to some type of philosophy. But, you know, another, on a philosoph- philosophical level, people will also say things such as, you know, f- you know, 
being in living in an anarcho capitalist society would only allow people the absolute strongest to survive. And, you know, in this case, I think that's kind of silly because I would say under a status system, it requires, you know, more, you know, more of a strength to survive that type of society. Because basically, you know, being able to make ends meet, you know, in a world where half your paycheck is being taken away and, you know, the fiat currency that you're using gets inflated to the point where it's nearly worthless and where justice is just, you know, gets stifled by this kind of state monopoly. You know, I would say that requires more strength to survive under than any, you know, anarcho-capitalist society. I disagree. Oh, I disagree. Oh. I think I think they're right. I think in an anarcho-capitalist society, the weak will be purged in a certain way. It's I like a heroin addict. By weak. It's it's like a heroin addict, right? right? What how do you how do you how do you stop a heroin addict from being a heroin addict? What's the number one thing that maintains them being a heroin addict? The fact that they're basically coddled. Yeah, enabling. Yeah, so, That's what the welfare state does. Is it incentivizes weak behavior? It doesn't. It's it's it it doesn't just. It isn't just difficult to get out of the welfare trap. Right. Sorry. It isn't just it isn't just difficult to succeed because of all the taxation and oppression and pressure. It also creates a trap and it poisons communities and it keeps them that way so that they can be used as a voting block. Whereas libertarianism, you don't get anything for free. I mean, people might come and they might help you out of charitable giving. Right. But they they're doing so because they expect a return on investment. Right. They, they respect some they expect something out of it. Right. You'd see a whole lot less. Here's your temporary stamps for needy assist, uh, needy families and a whole lot more. Here's a job program to help you off of your feet. And we pair with companies that need low skill, low wage workers and we and want to train them. But because you're destitute, we can pay you twelve dollars an hour instead of twenty dollars an hour. So like a great example of this is um, there's a job works program. The state of Virginia does this is a state example, right? Um, but but just, you know, broken clocks right twice a day. Um, and and one of the things that they do is they take young boys that don't have parents. It's what they do. Um, they take young boys that are orphans or like CPS has taken them away from their parents because they're just terrible parents, right? And they get them paired with jobs that are decent paying jobs that nobody wants to do. And when I say nobody, I mean nobody. So there's a there's a job like climbing cell phone towers to do cell phone tower repairs. And they train them to do that. These are high paying jobs, but most people, it's a very it takes a very special type of person to want to climb a mile in the air with just a lanyard and a rope and a little ladder rung, right? To fit, to replace a light bulb on a fucking tower that's swaying from side to side in the wind. Right. But people that have really struggled in their life, young men that have really seen the shit and they say, hey, there's a pathway out and we're going to pay you twenty five dollars an hour. They jump at that. Another one is cleaning up crime scenes, crime scene cleanup where they after the body's been removed and like getting rid of the burns, getting rid of the goo in the carpet. When I say goo, I mean a decomposed corpse. Right. Like things like that. So they pair them with these jobs that nobody wants to do. But, but they teach them skills sometimes with a, you know, you know, with the cell phone tower, it's a valuable skill with like the high rise window washing. It's a valuable skill with the crime scene cleanup. It's a skill. It's kind of low skill, but a lot of people don't want to do it. But nevertheless, it, it's like, these are this, it's hard to get applicants for these jobs. And so the state pairs up something that's hard to get applicants for the jobs with people who desperately need good paying jobs. And then they get paired together. And, and so the communist comes in and goes, that's horrible. How would you do that? Blah, blah, blah. And it's like, shut the fuck up. You're, every time your, your system is tried, you throw people in gulags, motherfucker. Like, stop fucking trying to take this moral high ground, right? Like, these people are destitute, and they're willing to do shit that nobody else is willing to do because they need the help. That is a system that you set these types of... That's the type of welfare system that will be incentivized by the market. And that's coincidentally the type of system that cleans up communities, not the type of system that puts people in a trap to keep them as a voting block because in a free market, there's no fucking voting block. Right. But like I said before, landlords want safer communities because they want their property values to go up. Everybody is incentivized financially in making their community better. And so a lot of these systems um, will, will be put in place 
of pairing people with jobs programs in the community um, that are the jobs that people don't want to do will be given to the people most desperate to do them uh, as a, that's real welfare. That's really helping somebody, teaching them a skill, giving them the means to learn how to get out of the out of their shit situation themselves, as opposed to giving them money that they're just going to waste and perpetuate the crime and perpetuate the poverty. Not to mention the police coming in and kicking down doors and arresting all your fucking dads. Right. I mean, I, I actually would agree with that. I think that you know any disagreement we might have there is that I think I'm just using weak and strong yeah, in a words, different context. Yeah. Right. When I say weak in the sense, like I'm somebody who believes that, you know, it's okay to be weak, but it's not okay to stay weak, for example. Like let's, you know, sometimes bad things might happen in life where you might find yourself, you know, down in your luck. And in that case, you know, you maybe in that case, there might be some type of, you know, like some type of lodge or something who could poten potentially assist you. But if you're willfully staying in that position, you know, what did you have the, you know, the power to control the power to change, you know, in that case, I mean, if you're willfully, you know, con remaining in that s situation, forcing other people to, you know, let's say in this case, we, where you have the state that is forcing people to subsidize that, then, you know, yes, I could definitely understand, like, th those people probably should be purged from society. And as far as strength, I'm talking about in the sense of, like, for example, I, I had somebody, I was talking to somebody once, who said, okay, let's say you make a let purchase. Me, let me interrupt, because I oh, look sure. real bad here, right? You don't purge weak people from society. You purge criminals oh, yeah. from society. But what you do is you you purge the weakness. I genuinely believe that all people are are uh, are capable of achieving great things, but they need to be stewarded into doing so when 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 they're broken. A lot of there's a lot of broken people in this country, and what what we have done for the past fifty years is is I think one of the greatest, the, the, the crime of statism is one that has so many victims that people really don't see is that instead of being stewards of our fellow man, what we have done is we have enabled weakness and we have enabled the very things that make them contemptible and we have pushed them further into their own cowardice, criminality and weakness. And it has been one of the most destructive and awful things. And, 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 and the, the, the commie fucks, the leftists, the, the, these people come around and they pretend to care about these people and they use them as pawns for an ideology because they resent or as Nietzsche put resentment or resentment, like depending upon your pronunciation, because French has like a billion different pronunciations. But right. these people pretend that they're the good guy. When really what they are is they hate the rich, they hate the successful, and they hate hierarchies because they know that they won't compete well in them. And it is it is those people that have lied and poisoned those people. It is, it is that system that has an opioid epidemic. It is that system that has hundreds of thousands of homeless people on skid row shitting on the streets. And, and, and they, and they, and they say, how dare you not give up more of your livelihood to feed these people? And I say, how dare you keep stealing from people and destroying the economy and inflating our currency and doing all of the things that stop us from actually helping these people. Right. Exactly. Yes. I mean, and as far as, you know, the idea of needing to be strong to survive in an anarchist society. The example I was thinking of was I was speaking to somebody who said, you know, let, let's say you were making a purchase and then let's say the merchant, you know, you're buying something from a merchant and the, the deal was, you know, you'd pay $20 for it. And I said, as you're buying it, actually it's $40 now. And also I'm going to take your shoes from you, which I mean, that's obviously, you know, a, a violation of the NAP in that case, you know, you're, you're flat oh, out stealing right. from somebody. Right. So I mean, that that's not a legitimate transaction by any means. And, you know, I mean, I, I work in a bank, for example. I mean, I see plenty of, I go through this. Fucking charges. banker. I, 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 Fucking I hate, banker. I just want to say on the record now, I hate my job. I hate working at a bank so much. Like, <laughs> I, I, I will quit one of these as soon as I get the opportunity. But, but still, yes, you know, it's like, I, I see plenty of people disputing charges. And, you know, as it is, this is something that goes on a lot. But as far as on the topic of working in a bank, I do want to say that, you know, my some people, well, not my personal concern, but I know some people out there have a concern that banks would be in a position to abuse customers without the government, you know, protecting them supposedly, because, you know, the banks have these lawyers, they have these complicated contracts that people could be confused by. They could potentially, uh, they could potentially be in a position to essentially take money from people, whether it's through the fees they charge or the different things such as that. And I know, you know, I think it might've been, uh, Bi yeah, I think Biden might've passed some stupid law, the Junk Fee Removal Act, which I, I mean, I personally think it's just a really stupid name for a, a law to be passed anyway. But in any case, um, 
do you think that there's a place, you know, for some type of third party, basically, to step in and prevent this type of potential abuse? Well, I mean, I mean, like, there's always the classic example of the rights enforcement agency. You know what I mean? Um, so when you look at contract law um, in, in, in English and in, in American um, common law, right, there's basically four defenses for um, canceling a contract, right? There is undue influence. There is illegality. This probably really wouldn't be a concern under an anarchist system. Um, but undue influence, duress, illegality, and then there's unconscionable, right? Um, now unconscionable is a weird one. It's kind of this wild card category of contract law. Um, and basically what an unconscionable, so an undue influence is essentially a contract, which I don't know whether or not anarchist communities will accept this. Um, I think this is part of the problem. This is why people need to talk and, and read more Kinsella is because we, we libertarians are us theory heads, right? You're obviously a theory head. I'm a theory head. A lot of people, a lot of the podcasters aren't theory heads and it's blatantly obvious. Um, but nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, us theory heads, we have this problem where we, 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 we speak strictly in terms of libertarian philosophy instead of what people will voluntarily recreate very quickly because it's just convenient, right? And so I think undue influence is one of those examples of contract law where it doesn't necessarily, it's not a necessary component of libertarian philosophy. It's not necessarily aggression, but I think most people would be like, okay, it, for a stable society, we want, con we want this form of contract law. And so most rights enforcement agencies are going to accept this and most businesses are going to accept this and communities and, and arbitrating firms are going to accept this, right? It, it just works. And so what this is, is something that is not a violation of the NAP, but it is something that just works. And what this just works is, is undue influence is, let's say I have a monopoly on the steel, right? And I have a competitor and then the competitor dies out, right? Now I then go to you and I say, Hey, remember that contract? Well, it's time to resign that contract. Um, but now I'm going to charge you triple the price, right? Now, purely in a libertarian perspective, they go, well, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, because that's super expensive, the, the company can just say no, and you've created a market void and another competitor will come in and the, it might not be as cheap as it was before, but they've raised the price so absurdly high that they're going to lose out business and another competitor will come into the market. Well, another competitor doesn't always come into the market, right? It doesn't always happen immediately. And, and businesses live and die by their supply. And so it's kind of exploitative, though it's not, right? But we kind of view our gut reaction is that it's kind of exploitative in this idea that you've tripled the price because you just happen to have it. And then very quickly later, another company comes in and charges, let's say, 120% of the old price, not 300%, right? Because it might be a little bit more difficult for them to procure. But like this company that has this monopoly is like so absurd in their pricing. But they don't just sell the product. They have these long-term contracts. And because you sign this long-term contract, you're now obligated, right, to, to finish out the term of the contract. And the contract says, hey, if you void this contract, that's fine, but you owe us $10 million, right? And so what I would say is that that's all perfectly le legitimate within libertarian theory. But in pragmatic reality, most companies will voluntarily set up a system where this isn't allowed, right? Because it, like, because people will take advantage of this and get these long-term uh, ridiculous fucking contracts and people will be like, I'm not signing this fucking contract, right? And then they go, well, you sign it or else. Um, and so, you know, I don't know exactly how that will balance, right? But that is a, a form of something. So now the unconscionable contract, I do think that rights enforcement agencies and arbitrating firms will absolutely enforce the unconscionable reason to get out of a contract. So the Supreme Court case that went forward in the United States for unconscionability was basically this. A Latino immigrant, first generation immigrant, right, um, came to America, got a payday loan, um, and the payday loan was something like 3% interest. And she, the contract was basically so difficult to read that lawyers had a hard time interpreting the contract, right? And she barely spoke any English. And basically through 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 like self-referential systems, what the contract actually said was that it was 3% interest every day. 
So every That's... single day, it was 3% interest, then 3% the next day, then 3% the next day, then 3%. And it wasn't 3% of principal. It was 3% of the total. So like it That's... very quickly oh. got to, yeah, it very quickly got from like a $500 loan to like you owe us 20 grand, right? Oh, and by the way, 20, we're going to do 3% of that. So like tomorrow it's going to be $20,000, $20,600. And then the next day it's going to be like another 610. And then like, and it just, it, it was multiplicative essentially. Um, and so, yeah, so like they basically said, this isn't like, this isn't violating any contract law, but it's such an absurd thing that strikes at the very conscience of a, the meaning of a contract that we refuse to enforce this contract. And like, that's how the unconscionable, it's not how the unconscionable contract was. Technically the first Supreme court case was about like a furniture company that had like a payment plan in like the 1920s, but that's not really important. Um, the, the big one was this one, right? Like, and so that's a defense. And so while I do think that there are situations where there are like, let's say holes in libertarian theory where like things might occur, there isn't a hole. Right. The whole is that like, even though it's not technically ag aggression, it's so shitty and it's so not good from a consequentialist perspective. Right. In, in the sense that like it is in the domain of things that are yet to not that I can't prove to be unjustifiable because it's not a violation of the nap via argumentation ethics. But it's so shitty and nobody would really want it except for the few people that find this loophole, if you will, loophole. Um that like it is in a loophole because voluntarily we would get rid of those things, right? Like our legal systems that we would set up are going to create legal codes and, and, and addendums, right? That the society agrees to that aren't necessarily violations of the NAP. But if you want to live in this community, you're, you're going to follow these rules because no one's going to do business with you and you're going to be excised from the community. And like, no one's going to like, you're not going to be able to do business in general. So like, you're not gonna be able to th survive. Right, exactly. You know, it's a very good way of putting it there. I, I would definitely agree with that. And, you know, I guess wrapping things up here, you know, um, wrapping things up, not, not because it's just late or anything, mainly because I'm just kind of running out of my out of my list of things to really. Yeah, no, I love these it. conversations. I'm glad, we, I'm glad we're doing it. I, I love going in like, I like to call it like professor mode because I'm instead of like yelling at a commie, I'm talking to right. someone and I, exactly. I love it and I'm long winded, but go ahead. All right. no, I, I like this. This is good. Um, one more question I have here, though, is that one thing I've noticed is that when we talk about the term privatization, there seems to be kind of a negative connotation that I've noticed a lot of people have about that. And I think it's because they kind of conflate that with exclusion. And I would say, in a sense, yes, privatization does mean to exclude people, but in other ways, no. And I would say the same thing can be said by looking at things in a public in a public way as well. So if we if we talk about, let's say, a public, you know, if we talk about, let's say, a public park, for example, you know, that's going to require public funds, you know, to keep it going. And whereas if it's a private, you know, private park, you know, it might not be, you know, yeah, you might not be able to go on it without paying a fee, but at least you're not being roped into paying a fee, regardless of whether you use it or not, which is right. what currently goes on under the state. So I think, you know, just from a, a PR standpoint, it's probably, I think, it, I personally try to say free market in place of private or privatization, even though obviously, you know, there are synonyms there. But I mean, just as far as trying to communicate these ideas, because I mean, to the average person out there on the street, you know, if you go up to them and start talking to them about anarcho-capitalism and you start telling them, OK, no government, you know, they, they tend to tense up at that. When in reality, I would say myself even that, you know, I don't even know if it's fair to say necessarily that anarchism, anarcho-capitalism would mean no government at all. It would just mean no you know, centralized government. What I would say in this sense is, you know, mm -hmm. for example, if, if, if I choose to go to bed at a certain hour. That is me governing my own life. You know, if I choose to go somewhere, that's me governing my own life. You know, if I chose to drive, you know, I mean, that's basically me intentionally taking purposeful human action to do something. That is an act of self-government. But it's just that when somebody else steps in and starts making these decisions for us on some level, you know, as the state does, that's, that's when it becomes, you know, basically other people making decisions for others. So basically where I'm getting to with this is from a PR standpoint, from the the idea of just as far as optics, what do you think is the best way we can present anarcho-capitalism, you know, to the masses? So I don't normally quote Scott Horton. A lot of people in my community kind of have like some issues with Scott Horton, because especially some of the people that are in my community that are Jewish, because he goes hard on Israel um, in a way. And, and 
And I don't know that he's necessarily a libertarian at all. Um, but he does have a really good point, which is attack the left from the left and attack the right from the right. You know, um, there is, you know, when you say what is the best message, the there's, there's kind of an implied thing that you're saying, what is the best message to everyone? And the answer is, is that there's no best message to everyone. There, you know what I mean? Like you can put forward some ideas to a large audience and it will resonate with people that are already libertarian minded, right? People that are already paleo libertarians, or maybe like they're, they're like not that serious lib socks. Um, you know what I mean? Like, like, you know, like they're, they're close to our ideology. And so because they're close to our ideology, they kind of understand and speak our language, right? When the real answer is, is that, you know, I don't often call myself an anarcho-capitalist a lot of times. I just say libertarian because to me, they mean the same thing, but also because ANCAP has a lot of baggage. I'm not going to lie. And I do want to reclaim that word. I do, but it's not, it's not tactically helpful to me to go, I am an ANCAP to someone whose only conception of ANCAP is Aren't ANCAPs, because this is what I heard online, those weird pedophile people that like, you know what I mean? That like are like crazy anarchists and stupid. It's like, whereas if I say libertarian, that that probably isn't what comes to mind for them. They probably think God, guns, and ganja. You know what I mean? They probably think, get the government out of my life. And everyone kind of has some level of government in their life that they don't like. And so what I would say is... um, attack the left from the left, attack the right from the right. Right. So, and, and, and communicate the ideas. Like, I don't think it's, I don't think you're ever going to turn a fucking fascist into a libertarian overnight. So like, why are you trying? You, you know what I mean? I see so many libertarians that are like, let me explain to you why you need to be an anarcho-capitalist. And it's like, I mean, that's cool, but you're talking to someone that's not even like, who's never voted for the LP Right. You're talking to someone that's like a, 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 a like if you're talking to a Nazi, you know what I mean? Or if you're talking to a communist, like what do you hope to gain from that? Is there an audience that you're hoping to capture? If that's OK, then burn them, flame them, fuck them. You know what I mean? Um, but if you're talking to someone that like you want to come over to your side, then then get them to come over to your side step by step. Plant those seeds that make them think about things in the future. Right. This isn't a fast process that you can do overnight. And I see so many libertarians that get frustrated because all they do, and it's partly it's because we're so fucking autistic. All they do is remember how I talked about the Plato's tripartite ethos, logos, pathos is they abandon ethos and often abandon a pathos that connects with who they're talking to. And they just do nothing but logos. And by logos, I mean logic. They go, let me explain to you why the non-aggression principle is correct. Let me explain to you why taxation is theft. Let me explain to you these highly logical arguments that the other party doesn't care about, right? What the other party cares about, and this is that rider and elephant thing, is mostly they care about pathos and ethos. These are way more important than logos. Way more important than, than, than a logical argument to most people is, do I trust you? Are you someone that I believe to be a reputable source of the information that you're providing, which is I don't, I don't think you're lying? I think what you're saying, you, you at the very least believe to be true. And then the other one is, can I emotionally connect with what you're saying? Right. And so this is like, you know, you know, tell a story, you know, engage in inner Gaia, be like, and, and, and don't go to the extremes. Go, I'm a libertarian. So you said you have this lefty coworker, right? Be like, you shouldn't go to a lefty coworker and be like, right. I'm an anarcho capitalism, free market capitalism, baby. Yeah. K- slash it. Slash <laughs> it. Slash it. Yeah, right. This like, that's a dump. Right. Like, like he's, he's like, it's never going to resonate with them. What you say is, I'm a libertarian, man. I don't know, man. Like, the government is constantly involved in our lives. And I see all these ways that it's failing. And I really just wish they could clean up and get out of the way so that we could actually help people. Right now, in their mind, help people is, you know, Get rid of useless programs, right? And then you speak to the lefty in a language that the lefty hears. When you want, when you're sitting around the water cooler and you're talking to some lefty, you don't say, "Hey, you know, I God, I really, really wish we could get rid of cap and trade emission carbon taxes because drill, baby, drill. We need more oil to unlock the free market of like of like dirt of coal. You know." Like fucking like cool. You made an enemy at work. You didn't do fucking a goddamn thing. But, you know, be like, oh, man, this Ukrainian-Russian war, 
And then they're like, yeah, man, like, I can't believe Russia invaded. Like, we got to help these people. And it's like, man, like, I get it. Like, I understand Russia's fucking evil. I understand all that stuff, man. But, like, we're spending hundreds of billions of dollars to keep perpetuating this fucking war. Like, why, like, why won't these people just sit down and talk peace negotiations, man? Like, you got, like, a nuclear power, these fucking crazy Russians doing all this crazy shit. Like, I mean, you've seen how much, like, all, all the shit they do in elections, all the shit they do online, all this evil shit. Like, you, you have to become friends. You have to establish trust, and you have to establish emotions, and then you can drop those seeds. I know it sounds like creepy commie shit that they do to infiltrate workers, but it's true. It's true of rhetoric. It's true of our lives. It's true of how people, th this, this push towards these hyper-logical arguments go nowhere because you're not communicating to anybody. So the right way to communicate to people is to speak their fucking language. Speak to them in a way that's meaningful to them and, and, and become friends with people and show them how much the state is bending them over and fucking them in the ass. Don't show, don't like, don't be, you, what you don't do is be LPNH to your coworker, uh, you know, LPNH's Twitter account to your coworker and be like, let me tell you why we need to ban child labor laws. Like, it, yes, we do. But like, that's not the right conversation, my guy. Like, it's not helpful. Yeah, like the picture of Meghan McCain. Yeah, you know, that was kind of controversial. You know, the yeah, it's like, they're not that. wrong. They're not wrong, oh, but yeah. it's like, who the fuck is that helping? Like, it's just helping. It's just getting negative engagement. And now me, as a different content creator, I got to go around and defend that shit, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's technically true. But yeah. I also got to be like, well, it's bad tactics. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's stupid. Right, exactly. And so I've always found it funny how people, you know, so many people on the left will complain, you know, when... They'll, they'll say we need to take $50 billion away from, you know, these these billionaires there so we can put it towards, you know, the common welfare. But they don't mind when that money that could have gone towards the common welfare is instead, you know, just taken and put direct, sent directly to Ukraine in the form of military equipment and things like that. Well, it's, it's the, we, hold on, Ev, Morgan, Morgan, we have to save our democracy. Democracy oh, <laughs> is under threat. Democracy Ooh. needs to be saved, all right? I, I don't know what you're talking about. We have to save democracy. Um, yeah, I mean... People will believe fucking anything, man. I mean, like that's and that and that it's unfortunate, but like most people, most people want to fit in, and most people want to be want to not cause problems. And most people, if you tell them if you believe this thing, you'll be on the right side of history, and you'll fit in, and we're gonna help these people. They'll forgive a lot of failures and a lot of things just to go go along to get along. Right. Exactly. You know, very well said. But yeah, I mean, you know, just in conclusion, I, I mean, I'm, thanks for coming out, Scott. I mean, I really appreciate this episode. You know, I mean, it's been a yeah. really fun experience. You know, I saw your content and thought, you know, this guy is, you know, this guy's hilarious. And he, you know, makes a lot of good points regarding, you know, the whole ideology that I'm trying to point out. So I figured, you know, definitely should get this guy on the show. And you know, I'm glad we were able to do this. So yeah, no, so. I'm, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad, you know, I, I, you know, I hope you, um, I hope you succeed in, in interviewing and stuff like, you know, I know you're just starting out and like this is, you know, and you're just getting into this. I just, you know, one of the things I hate in this space is the longer I've been in this space, the overwhelming majority of content creators in the space are grifters that only give a fuck about clout and only give a fuck about like how many views do you get and things like that. I just want to have good conversations and produce and produce good content for the people that are watching my shit. And, uh, and you seemed interesting. So I was like, yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. Um, you know, so yeah, I'm, I'm glad we could have this conversation. Nice. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. And to everybody out there, I just want to say thanks for tuning in. This has been Morgan Meets the Eye. Make sure to follow me and Scott on social media. Subscribe, comment, and above all, keep asking why. Everybody out there, have a good one. Bye-bye.